All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the spring lung committee meeting here in San Francisco. Thank you so much everybody for joining us uh, in person as well as those that are joining us virtually today. Excited to be here. So we just have a couple, quick, little, couple, quick, little, couple of quick updates that I wanna go through. So one is that we have a new SWOG lung map champion. You know, these individuals that serve in this role are those that shepherd the protocols, our protocols through the system. We. Um, Fortunately, unfortunately for us, um, uh, Dr. Suki Pata has moved institutions and now she'll be with ECOG. And so um, uh, Dr. John Rangel will now be our new SWOG um, representative. He unfortunately is unable to join us um, in person, but he's done a great job. The study leadership on S1800D uh, and now he's tasked with uh, C1, do one, teach one. So we're really excited for John. Uh, we also have uh, some subcommittees. Um, one of them is a thoracic neuroendocrine subcommittee, and what, who, these are our co-chairs, Dr. Nagla Kareem, as well as Dr. Sonam Puri. So wave your hands so everybody can see you guys, and Dr. Puri is over there. I'm really excited. They've already done such a phenomenal uh, job uh, that I've now asked them to start prioritizing the studies that are coming through. So you hopefully we'll have more to come that we'll be sharing with this group uh, publicly, um, hopefully by the fall. Um, be, there's been lots of activity. We know that small cell lung cancer, neuroendocrine, carcinoid, you name it, the full spectrum, there's a lot of areas of need and lots of opportunities that I think that this group can collaborate across and drive science forward and impact for our patients. The early stage committee, so Dr. Hofstetter from um, uh, MD Anderson has stepped down, and so now we have Dr. Eric Toloza, thoracic uh, surgical oncologist um, here, who's going to be co-chairing with Ray Osero Gagbon. Uh, Ray, are you here? I think most of us know him. He is, I know he had another committee that he had to chair, and I think he'll be joining us uh, shortly. So really excited to have them here again. You know, this, this committee in particular, and the other ones that I'll mention are really tasked with, we have some big monster trials in our cooperative group network and early stage with um, Alchemist. And so looking at that study and then trying to determine where are the opportunities outside of that? What are the, un the questions that still remain and how do we answer those? In the locally advanced, we have uh, Dr. Sarah Goldberg. She's here. Sarah, stand or wave your hand. She was here yesterday. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Megan Daly, I know she's unable to join us today. So they're gonna be um, heading up our locally advanced subcommittee. And again, we know that we have the ECOG, I think it's 5181, uh, stage three unresectable non-small cell lung cancer study and seeing where's the field going in the future? What are those questions that we should be asking as a group? And in the metastatic, now we have Rachel Sanborn. Uh, Ross Kamage has stepped down from his role and she will be um, uh, sharing a co-chair role uh, with Dr. Redcamp, who's also heading up our Pragmatica and our lung map. So um, we have Dr. Redcamp over here, if you want to wave your hand, and also uh, Dr. Rachel Sanborn, who I think is joining us virtually, if I'm not mistaken. They have been tasked, right, in the setting of Pragmatica and uh, Lung Map, you know, what are the other questions within stage four and how do we move those concepts forward? So really excited, all-star team. Um, hopefully again in, in the fall, we'll have some more concepts to share with you. So this is our uh, agenda here, packed agenda. I'm gonna ask, like I did yesterday, everybody be efficient, um, lean and mean with your presentations, high level, wanna be respectful of everybody that spends all the time preparing their presentations and um, really look uh, to making this interactive possible. Really excited to have our ISLAC CEO and former chair of the Lung Committee, Dr. Karen Kelly. So please help give, me a, give her a round of applause. Really excited to have her. She is our keynote speaker. Um, Karen, did you bring your gavel for the talk? <laughs> You're not going to use it just now. When we get to the panel, I understand. So, um, you know, really excited to have her. She's going to be giving us a nice discussion on the overall global landscape, right? It's like as a global community. We, uh, we know that there are international sites within the um, cooperative group network. So really think big or go home, right? And where do we go from there? Then we have a panel of expertise, of experts um, who are going to be joining us. I think um, Dr. Harpreet Singh from the FDA, who's online. Uh, Dr. Jeff Allen from the FDA, um, from Friends, is also going to be joining us. Um, we have Dr. Shakun Malik, who I saw walk in, and she's here somewhere, who's also going to be on the, thank you, there are a lot of people in the room, we got a packed house, and there's Roy, all right, we found Roy, and he's got his Diet Coke, of course, so, um, <laughs> no, Diet Pepsi. oh, Diet Pepsi, sorry, um, so Dr. Malik from the NCI, we have Dr. Redcamp, who's um, heading up our project Pragmatica, and Dr. Mary Redman, who's our biostatistician, all-star biostatistician, and I don't know where Mary is, but she will be here by the time the panel starts. So really looking forward to that. 
Okay. Um, just a couple of updates we've had uh, at ASCO this year, you know, look out for these posters um, and as well as an oral presentation by Dr. Nagla Kareem. She's done an outstanding job of getting the slides together and lots of information, you know, the small cell again is going to, is an area of definite need and anything we can as this uh, lung cancer community help to move forward. So look out for that oral presentation as well. So kudos to all of the presenters. All right. And with that, we will hand it off to Judy Johnson, our patient advocate. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you in person. So I've been a part of this committee for about six years now, and it's been an amazing experience. I've worked with many of you. And today, what I want to find out I want to find out how many of you have been able to engage with me as your patient advocate. And if you have, what were some of the benefits that you got? And if you haven't, what were some of the things that were keeping you from doing so? So I'll have a few polling questions and I would really appreciate it if you would answer them. Any of you who put together concepts, protocols, consents, please give me your feedback so that I can even do a better job than I do already. And I hope that I do indeed do a good job now. So the leading principle of SWAG, patients are our highest priority. We've lived this value by building the largest, most sophisticated patient advocate program in the NCTN. And we have just over 30 advocates. So I'm really proud to be a part of that group. And some of my colleagues are here in the room and thank you for being here. So uh, we focus on research or on the community. So we have research advocates like me, and we are our, your clinical trial experts. Community advocates represent their own communities and can give you feedback in general. For example, adolescents and young adults, Latinx, military veterans, and they work across all the committees in SWAG to give you their feedback. So my role basically is to collaborate with all of you and SWAG staff, who I might say is outstanding. Whoops. I'll keep going from a time the concept is developed through protocol design, implementation, and accrual. You guys are gonna help me out, right? <laughs> this thing doesn't do anything. This is the computer that controls everything. I got you, stay over there. Okay, I got you. Which one is it? That one. That one, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So let me move forward. So this comes direct out of the Patient Advocate Committee Handbook, and it's a comment from Dr. Blanke, and I'm really proud that he has said this about our group. And Rick Bangs, our chair, collaborated with Dr. Blanke, other members of SWOG leadership, and our committee members to build out and demonstrate the value of what we do for you. So as you can see, the first sentence is advocates make our trials better. Well, that's only true when there's a high level of patient advocate involvement from the beginning. So as I told you, I'd like to explore the current state of your engagement by asking you some polling questions. So you've already got the instructions, I believe. Does everybody know how to do it? Okay, awesome. There it is. Okay, so the first question, um, and please do respond. I'll, I'll be watching these bars and hoping for lots of numbers. It shouldn't look like that on the screen. It shouldn't? Uh-oh. All right. Well, <laughs> the, the, the gist of my uh, presentation was basically to ask those questions. So I'll go to the end and hope that they have it fixed before. But otherwise, let me move on to tell you a little bit about advocacy groups that we've been working with, because one of the goals is for us to expand our scope, do outreach to advocacy groups so that we can tell them about our trials, communicate with them what we've got, and help them help their uh, constituents get involved with the trials. So we've developed relationships with all of these groups, either small or large, some are more uh, developed than others. 
And recently we've worked hard to enrich our relationships with GoTo and Longevity, which are the two largest groups. So being on the NCI TMSC has helped me really develop the role with my fellow advocate who is at Longevity. And uh, he's the manager of scientific research there. At GoTo, I was recently asked to participate in a panel on the vital role that patients play in advancing research. So that gave me the chance to meet patients, survivors, caregivers, uh, oncologists, and other advocates and build some relationships with that organization as well. And I'm happy about the fact that this June, Dr. Reckham and Dr. Gandera will participate in person at GoTo in one of their lung cancer living room sessions to talk about what clinical research is, educate the patients about the value of it, and share information about pragmatic lung. So many of us do have relationships with some of these organizations, including you, I'm sure. So let's keep them going and collaborate to expand them even further. So here's what we'll do moving forward. Although, unfortunately, unless this gets fixed pretty quick, and maybe I can do it later, um, I will follow up on whatever the results are to continue to strengthen the work that we do together and then also work towards continuing to build on the patient advocate organization relationships. So I appreciate all that you do to help patients. I will continue to do that with you. So please reach out to me. Let me see if I could give you my email. Yeah, please write this down for yet and would like to get to know me. Please reach out to me and thanks so much for your time. Can I ask you one question? Can yeah. I ask you one question? So when we have somebody developing a concept or they have an idea, at what point would you, do you think is the ideal time that to get you involved? Is it right off the inception? Is it when we, um, are ready to go to the exec committee? At what point in that do we involve the patient advocate? Before you do anything except think of it. Yeah. So yeah. think of it and yeah. let me know. Yeah. You don't even have to have anything in writing. Just send me an email, say, here's yeah, an idea. Yeah. Um, what do you think? And if I can reach out to other advocates yeah. to get their feedback, because it, it if patients won't participate, it's not going to make any difference. Yeah. Yeah. So from the very get-go, even okay. before there's a written concept. That's great. So I think if all of our subcommittee um, chairs and co-chairs yeah. can keep that in mind when people come to you with concepts, that you're going to um, also start looping in Judy as, as early as possible to get those vetted. Yes, like thank you so much. Point. I may be okay. back. Yes. All right. Oh, yes. Yes. And I'm just curious if that's affecting a lot of other people. Yeah. And since some people from the FDA are here, I, don't I just know. wondered what Shikun. the source of that is. And Shikun, why do is you want to? Do you want to? I don't know if Shakun, if you want to tag that question. So we we've started some discussions with the NCI about how to handle the shortage of of platinum. We have Insigna, that's a big trial. We have the Alchemist IO study that's very big within the cooperative groups. Shakun, I don't know if you want to come to a mic or come up here and answer. Just uh, for those individuals on on uh, joining us virtually can also hear. Uh, good question. Good question. We're all struggling with this. We need to come together. Yeah, to so this is NCI. Up. So we're working on it. So our PMB um, has is working with uh, to see how they can resolve this. We're all aware of it. Yeah. I think some people are looking at amending protocols. Um, I think moving forward, we might need to give more consideration. Also, uh, what people are thinking about is looking at allowing regimens such as Checkmate 9LA, um, you know, where they would have maybe not allowed that regimen before in the past. So uh, trying to be as flexible as possible. Right. Yeah, at the recent AATR meeting, this came up at the policy committee. We asked the FDA uh, leadership there as well. Isn't that, that a great tool? Not working. Is the, is the mic on? Yeah. This, this is an economic issue. Um, you know, companies don't make money on these drugs and the government's going to have to step in to have them produced. But certainly there are some curable tumors that require these drugs like cisplatinum. And um, it is something that I know that is being talked about in Washington, but right now, hopefully we'll have to, we'll get exemptions when we have to switch. Yeah. I know we have a uh, Dr. Singh joining us too from the FDA online. I don't know, um, you'd like to comment? Harpreet, she might not be here yet. That is not. 
Okay. Uh, the website, it can be, you know, how to manage it. the investigators. Okay. So you can put it on your Okay, perfect. That would be great. All right, and we have uh, Dr. Eric Tolosa giving us the update from our thoracic uh, surgical committee. Hello, um, welcome. Uh, so I'm taking over from Wayne uh, Hofstetter, who stepped down recently. All right, so just wanted to remind everyone that we still have uh, alchemist accruing patients. So this is actually an umbrella uh, protocol that covers at least five uh, trials. Uh, there's the screening trial, which is A151216, uh, which is, of course, ongoing. And then there's E4512, the crizotinib uh, treatment trial for those pa patients who are positive for ALK. And this is crizotinib versus observation, which previously, uh, which replaced the previous uh, placebo arm following standard adjuvant treatment. This is getting close to accrual, but it's still accruing. Most recently activated was A081801, uh, which is integration of immunotherapy into adjuvant uh, therapy with chemo IO, which using PEBRO uh, for patients who are not EGFR or ALK positive. Uh, close to accrual is their Lotnib trial, as well as the nivolumab uh, treatment trial, EA5142 and A081105. So uh, Alchemist is uh, for both non-squamous and squamous non-small cell lung cancer, stage 2, 3A, and 3B that are N2, uh, 3B, per the eighth edition of AGCC. These are uh, post-op negative surgical margins. If they're non-squamous patients, uh, they then um, are tested for EGFR, ALK, and PDL one And if they are ALK positive, they go into the uh, E4512 trial. If they're uh, EGFR and ALK negative, then they can go into the immunotherapy trial. For squamous patients, only PDL one testing is required, and then they go into the immunotherapy trial. So patients can either uh, pre-register for uh, eligibility, and uh, these are suspected or known uh, resectable non-small cell lung cancer and suspected uh, stage 3B, T3, T4, N2 um, uh, lung cancer. And then uh, patients can then also register after they're resected uh, for completely resected uh, no, uh, negative margin patients. Again, pathologic stage uh, 3B, uh, 3A, or 2. Tissue available for required analysis and patients with local gen genotyping are eligible regardless of the local result. Um, for squamous patients, uh, no adjuvant treatment is permitted. Uh, they have to be registered within 77 days following surgery. For non-squamous patients who don't have uh, adjuvant uh, therapy, they need to be registered within 77 days following surgery. Uh, but if they did get adjuvant chemo or, or radiation, uh, they can be registered within 225 days. If they got both chemo and radiation, they need to be registered within 285 days. So this is the E4512 crizotinib uh, trial. Uh, again, uh, patients are then surgically resected and have uh, uh, ALK mutation or fusion. Uh, they uh, then get adjuvant chemo radiation as indicated. Then they get registered and either get crizotinib or observation. Uh, and crizotinib is given for two years. Uh, sorry, the primary endpoint is disease-free survival. Uh, there is... Uh, um, uh, you know, ALK, ALK mutations are relatively rare. Only 3% of cases in Alchemist screen are ALK positive, but we're getting close to enrollment. As of January, there was 146 out of 168 patients enrolled. This is the study designed for the immunotherapy protocol for EGFR and ALK negative patients. Uh, after uh, surgical resection with R0 resection, they're enrolled and randomized to either platinum doublet or platinum doublet with pembrolizumab, uh, which are given as four cycles as tolerated. And then uh, they get uh, pembrolizumide for uh, 16 cycles as adjuvant treatment or pembrolizumab to total um, 16 cycles. 
Um, this is the, uh, the data that I was able to get for this study. And as of uh, August 2022, there were um, 276 accrued out of a target of 1,210 uh, target. Uh, there, the accrual rate uh, for the past, uh, the, the previous three months was about 12 per month. There was a temporary closure um, after, I believe, the atezolizumab uh, data came out uh, that uh, was like a five-month um, temporary closure, and then the study was reopened. All right, so. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Any questions later? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thanks, All right. All right, Dr. Park, give us the thoracic radiation update. All right, thank you very much. I'll be, spe I'll, I'll be stepping in for Dr. Daly today, who's out of town. All right, so um, we have three ongoing trials now in the radiation group. Uh, for, uh, the SWOG uh, 1827, the Maverick trial is ongoing. Uh, accrual is picking up. As of April 30th, we had uh, 141 patients out of 600. I'm not sure if Dr. Rustovin's on the line to uh, speak about this as well, uh, but if so, please interrupt me. Uh, but this is uh, this is a trial open for all limited stage and extensive stage small cell lung cancers. My understanding is about half and half so far in terms of the accruals and limited stage and extensive stage. Um, it's still controversial in both areas. Um, and uh, really, the question is whether we do uh, if, if, if we're doing MRI surveillance alone or doing MRI surveillance with prophylactic cranial irradiation. Um, so, um, so that's the plan. For, uh, so that, that, that's what's uh, going on with this study. I think there's um, some work being done on this to uh, see if this this number, the, the final um, number can be, um, if, if, if it could actually be lowered depending on on what the primary endpoint will be. So I think that's still being that, that that's still ongoing currently to see if we can get this down from 600. Now, uh, S1914, uh, it's from Dr. Daly and Dr. Simone. Uh, this is really picking up accrual quite quickly. So as we heard um, at, at, the, at the meeting yesterday, the, the, the accrual numbers were a little bit slow to start, um, you know, given that it opened in March of 2020. Uh, but since then, um, you know, after, after about a year or two, and, and, and once, once more, the, the larger centers were able to pick up uh, to really activate this and also get, get some, uh, some overall momentum, um, you know, some more, more and more patients interested in this uh, study. It's been accruing about 10 per month, uh, which is uh, higher than the the, what was expected originally with eight, eight per month. Um, so this is really picking up quite well. Uh, this is for all stage one non-small cell lung cancers. Uh, if they're at least two centimeters or have an SUV greater than 6.2. Um, so these are, um, the, uh, and, and really the question is, 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 is doing immunotherapy uh, before uh, SBRT, uh, followed by SBRT and, and, and really having, having uh, immunotherapy for a total of six months. And if you're not randomized to that arm, then you get SBRT alone. And, and, and so this has been, um, I think, um, the, 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 the overall accrual has been, been uh, a lot better here. And here's 1933, a smaller study with a, the, 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 the target of 47. Uh, this is picking up as well and, and uh, more than halfway done now at 28, uh, but we need a little bit more to, to get to the finish line. Uh, this will be for all stage two patients who have ECOG one to two uh, or stage three patients with ECOG two. And they get 60 gray in 15 fractions, so hypofractionated regimen uh, for those with, without great performance status. Or again, if they have stage two disease that they're inoperable, but they're, they still um, can have an ECOG one to two. Uh, after that, they get uh, they 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 actually it's, it's it's a single arm study, so then they'll get immunotherapy after that uh, for up to twelve months. And uh, yeah, this opened in, in June two thousand twenty. So this is this is uh, uh, the, you know they're they're more than halfway done now. And then uh, we had a, a we, we 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 earlier this morning had a meeting uh, with the surgical uh, subcommittee uh, that, that was combined with the radiation subcommittee. I uh, had a very productive meeting. Probably had about 20, 25 people there. Uh, we talked about concepts in in other spaces as well. You know, we have three uh, you know there 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 are three trials that are ongoing, but many others that are being considered currently. Uh, we're planning for virtual meetings every every actually I wrote here every three months, but there's actually a lot of appetite for doing this even monthly uh, going forward. Uh, and we invite uh, you know for radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, surgeons, and really all others to come join us for these meetings. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Park, stepping in for uh, Dr. Daly there, who's unable to make it. All right, now we have Phil Max talk to us about translational medicine. Thank you very much. Um, so as always, welcome to the translational medicine part of the uh, meeting and on behalf of Fred Hirsch. Uh, I will present uh, just a tiny bit of data that we'll be showing at ASCO. 
uh, and then uh, some discussion on future concepts. Uh, so in terms of just basics, some manuscripts uh, have been published. Uh, S1507 is now uh, in press. It will be published. Uh, and we have some of our uh, lung map TM ones that need to be moved forward, including the ctDNA, uh, which is now going to be two papers, which actually kind of, I think, makes it an easier job to get that out. Um, what I wanted to actually just sort of preview for you, uh, we will be showing this at ASCO. Uh, but here is some data that we generated from LungMap on the liquid biopsy comparison between tissue and uh, uh, plasma. And what you're looking at here is the prognostic effect of tumor fraction. What is tumor fraction? This is a global assessment of the amount of circulating uh, tumor DNA that is out there. Uh, but it is not generated by looking at individual mutant allele frequencies or variant allele frequency, if you prefer that term, such as EGFR, even though those are very interesting. This is kind of a global assessment of it based on aneuploidy. Uh, so it takes a lot more into account. It gives you a much better, more specific picture about the amount of tumor DNA that is making up the cell-free DNA component. Uh, and it turns out to be, as we expected it to be, very prognostic. Uh, you can see here those that have a low uh, tumor fraction, which includes those that have uh, no detectable uh, CTDNA at all, uh, are uh, have a much uh, more favorable outcome than compared to those uh, who have high levels above 10%. And this makes perfect sense. And I want you to kind of think about this in your own practices when you are interpreting a CTDNA result that you might have gotten on one of your patients. It's always disappointing when it's negative. Uh, because it's not giving you any information. But bear in mind, that is actually a good thing from the patient's point of view. That's a, a very strong prognostic marker. It's not great to have a whole lot of circulating tumor DNA out there. If you have a slower, more indolent tumor, or one that is being uh, capably suppressed by uh, therapy, and you're seeing a zero reading, that's actually good. And of course, that translates very much to uh, a lot of the surgical concepts and early stage concepts that we'll be talking about soon. So anyway, if you want more detail on this, uh, it will be a poster at ASCO. Um, so let's talk about liquid biopsies in early stage. Uh, this is a big focus now for the committee. Uh, and I really want to emphasize, at least in my mind, and I'd be interested in anybody uh, who has a, a, a different viewpoint, that the use of uh, residual disease markers seems to be essentially inevitable at this point. It's just a matter of when we can become comfortable enough to introduce this into the clinic and use this as a guide for whether patients need additional therapy after complete resection, uh, or essentially whether adjuvant therapy is appropriate or not. Uh, now we'll discuss the, the pros and cons of, of deploying this right now, but in my mind, this is an, an inevitable technology that will be used uh, very soon. It's typically used right now as a rule in assay which is to say that it's generally calibrated to emphasize uh, specificity over sensitivity. Sensitivity is obviously a huge issue. There's no assay out there that's gonna perfectly predict the presence of really microscopic uh, tumors that aren't shedding much DNA. Uh, but we wanna make sure that we're not being lied to. We wanna make sure that there really is evidence of tumor if we're seeing it in the ctDNA. And that's how these things are usually set up. So it may miss uh, the presence of some tumors. But over time, as those tumors grow and develop and evolve, those were, they will release more ctDNA, and you can actually see it over time. Uh, but we need to be confident in those assays. Now, there actually has been some discussion recently of doing exactly the opposite, kind of a rule out or a de-escalation of therapy using ctDNA, which is a very compelling and interesting concept. Just one word of warning on that. Certain therapies particularly chemotherapy and, and targeted therapies, can cause cytostatic responses, which will significantly limit the amount of CTDNA that's out there, but not necessarily associated with uh, tumor control and tumor depth. So if your patient is on certain types of therapy and you're looking to see whether that CTDNA clears as to whether you should stop that therapy, that can be dangerous in certain co uh, contexts. So we can discuss the ins and outs of that as it evolves. Okay, so monitoring over real-time 
to reveal recurrence as early as possible. What we don't actually right, know right now is how early these newer assays are actually going to predict recurrence. Uh, if it was just a couple of weeks before the patient is symptomatic or imaging uh, reveals positivity, then it's not really that interesting. But even with the old technologies of eight years ago, we could routinely see the presence of T790 in the EGFR uh, treated patients six to eight weeks before uh, recurrence or, or in that case progression was known, uh, either by the patient becoming symptomatic or they got around to having an image. So, but now we're talking about extremely sensitive MRD type assays that are orders of magnitude more sensitive than what we had back then. So we don't know, no one seems to know, I haven't found the data yet, how early it can actually predict recurrence. It could be three, four, five, six months, we don't know. Um, but that is a significant lead time that makes it very interesting. So the proposition here is, should we include a liquid biopsy-based MRD assay into every early stage concept? Are we essentially um, being immoral if we are not actually tackling these, this concept in SWOG right now? Uh, and maybe that's a bit of a bias there. But if this is technology that is going to be used in, uh, in context of, of patients constantly, we need to uh, evaluate all of our studies and all of our study endpoints under this uh, guise of MRD because it will inform every single thing that we're looking at. Now, the alternative is we don't do that. We wait for the definitive assay to become available. And that's a genuine, you know, realistic concept. So there are advantages and disadvantages to doing this. The advantage, of course, is that SWOG will have significant impact on how these are developed. We can uh, have some say in how these things are moved into future concepts, how they're moved into clinical practice. Uh, this will also improve our publishing opportunities for our trials, but it does require a proactive strategy. Now that in itself is not a bad thing, but there are costs, upfront time, negotiation, expense, a lot of bureaucracy associated with it. Uh, it needs to be uh, have separate statistical power and accrual go goals. There'll need to be a lockdown assay. So there's a lot that's involved in doing these things. Uh, so there are disadvantages. Now we've talked about these mechanisms before, integral and integrated. Uh, and if you're not a clinical trialist, you may think, "What well, you know? Why does this matter to me? Why am I bringing it up?" But bear in mind that each of you, if you are contributing to our trials, will have to understand and go through these processes of getting, collecting the specimens, and submitting them in real time. So. These things are very important to all of you who actually uh, register patients to our trials. So integral, by definition, excuse me, is something that's required for the trial to proceed. It's basically built into its inherited to the design. And essentially, typically, but not always, it's used for patient assignment to therapy. Uh, in contrast, integrated is a slightly lower level and easier to achieve. Uh, and the intent here is to clinically validate a test or an assay. And this is their specific wording from uh, CTEP. Uh, and this is generally for use in a either a future integral trial or actually to segue to clinical practice. Now, this is very important just in of itself. We want to help uh, validate clinical assays. But from my point of view, um, what we need to set the stage now with an integrated study is so that the next round of trials that we do have these as an integral study and that we know what we're doing in terms of the use of these things. Integral has the highest funding priority. So when do these things uh, do? The problem with an integral study is that it must be part of the parent concept. It must be submitted upfront. Uh, integrated has some options for uh, submitting that later, which are important. Critically, though, uh, to get funding from these, it needs to be uh, either a phase two or a phase three treatment or prevention trial. Uh, and it has to be randomized, except, and there's a different option here, 
uh, it can be a non-randomized phase two or phase three trial if it's an integral study that's the highest level. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'll take any questions. So fantastic presence. It's a nice overview um, thinking about, you know, throughout all these committees we have, we want to talk about how do we intermix these? So we're going to switch computers. So we're going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you a question while they're doing that. Um, we hope he's right behind you. Um, so, um, Phil, if you want to maybe sit here for, and then we can just ask a quick question while they do that. So I'm thinking, um, how do we get funding, right? That was, I, I think everybody here agrees with you. I think liquid biopsies are here to stay. They are the wave of the future. We will be looking at getting these, um, continuing to integrate these into our studies. How do we pay for it? What are the, what are the, what are the funding options? Extremely important. Uh, and that last slide was addressing that a little bit. That had to do with uh, the mainstay funding for clinical trials, the BIQ uh, funding, uh, which is biomarker and imaging quality control uh, funding. Uh, and as mentioned, those re do require a randomized large trial. Uh, unless you're doing it integrated, uh, uh, integral, in which case you, you can use a non-randomized study, uh, which is germane to some of the studies that are in development right now. Uh, if you're lucky to get BIQ, it's usually pretty good funding. It requires a pretty significant grant to be put in. Uh, if you're doing an integral study, it all has to be kind of packaged together. And that makes it very difficult, right. yes. Yeah. But if it's integrated, that can be done much later. So yeah. generally three months after submission, uh, but there are options if you're not doing it in real time for, to submit at a much later date. So um, otherwise, uh, pharma support is almost essential, uh, even if you have BIQ or specimen collection. Uh, SWAG and our SWAG grant and the Hope Foundation will provide some support for banking for certain types of trials if they're large enough and if they're randomized. Uh, and then otherwise, you're resorting to grants. And uh, we've had some success with R21s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the like before, but those are hard to count on and hard to get in a time frame that is useful to you. So I think we I think the, the lesson here is to explore all options. And it sounds like uh, in addition to our patient advocates is to make sure that we get Phil, our translational medicine teams involved early also in this concept development. That's great. And so, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see Phil get all to Sorry, yeah, I don't know. We're not going to tie. So, clearly, this is where we're at. We have to go to a microphone for our Oh, good question. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll skip the part about Phil getting yeah, choked up. That's okay. but, but, but clearly, this is where we're going. I think we all agree on that. Okay, it's complex, ugly, wicked, uh, but that's where we're going. So, so my question back to you, Phil, is, is it possible to make the upfront efforts to maybe develop a modular way to just plug and play this? If it's that important, may, maybe what we need to do is the upfront work to dump it down so we can just plug it in as people develop their proposals. Yeah. That's a fantastic point. And it's something that we have been working on during this meeting. Uh, so... I didn't want to raise it here because it's not quite developed and yet it's a big topic, um, but we are looking for solutions where we can really integrate this technology uniformly across all of our trials, including late stage, uh, and not just liquid biopsies for ctDNA and monitoring over time, but, but looking at uh, profiles and predictive algorithms for IO, that sort of stuff. If we can do this sort of in a programmatic way, uh, across multiple studies, perhaps using a single reference lab, uh, then I think uh, that will give us not just the ability to be more nimble with it when we go to put it in, you know, plug it into a trial, uh, but also give us a very wide look across studies and drug types and disease stages uh, that we can kind of compare and contrast. So, yes, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, if we had something like the Hope Foundation, I guess yeah, Hope Foundation. We can just, we'll, re, we'll repeat it. Hope Foundation. To, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the Hope Foundation to fund everything, always for us. Is that you? I agree. <laughs> we agree. Yes. <laughs> Good solution. Yeah.
Yeah, so I had a comment, and uh, uh, we discussed this a bit yesterday in our lung working group, but it, it, there's a lot of complexity here. When you look at the literature on the sensitivity of at least some of the uh, MDR assays, they're not consistent with clinical care. In other words, they get an assay about a month after surgery, and then they get one at three months, then they get one at six months, then they get one at nine months. And if it ever turns positive, they report that in their sensitivity. That's disingenuous because it means that you cannot use that information to make a treatment decision, whether it's treatment de-escalation, escalation, omission, and so forth. And when those same assays have been put into phase three trials, bladder cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, they have not performed very well because you only get one shot in goal for a clinical trial. In other words, if it's eight weeks, then you make your decision about therapy. So it's tricky. And the best, you know, here's one place where lung is not leading. It's, adju it's adjuvant treatment of colorectal cancer. There are three randomized phase three trials, which are past half accrued now, escalation, de-escalation, omission. Mm -hmm. And I think we can learn a lot from some of these other tumor types here. Uh, but the, the problem, as Phil said, is picking the right assay. And it's, uh, you know, I think Phil makes a good point about you can't wait. On the other hand, we don't want to take curable patients, you know, our most curable patients with non small cell lung cancer and use the assays in a way that they're really not currently suited for. So, any of that's, I'm the yeah. chief medical officer for the International Society of Lipid Biopsy. So, <laughs> we had a big workshop on this topic as yeah. well as at, at ACR. Yeah, no, I think those are great points, David, and thanks for bringing that up. And I think I think one of the lessons there, uh, there definitely is, you know, reaching across the aisle to those GI teams and seeing what are the lessons learned, right? Um, and how do we grow from there? So good points. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I think we got the poll going. Okay. Pretty. All right. So we're going to, let's see there. Let's do this. Yes. All right. All right. Thanks for thanks for bearing with me. Now now I know you guys are going to answer me because you're going to feel so bad that I was standing up here <laughs> waiting for it to work that you have to answer the questions now. So, all right. So um, as I mentioned before, this is for those of you who develop concepts, protocols, informed consents, um, et cetera. So, um, oh, you're already answering it. Go for it. I don't even have to read the question. Okay. Two... Two people, that is definitely not enough. The more you tell me, the better I can do to help you. <clears throat> Keep going. I'd like to see at least 30. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. That's awesome. It's getting bigger. Yeah, almost 25. I'll give you another couple of seconds and then I'll move on. All right. Well, that's good. At least the top two bars are bigger than the bottom two bars. So I will follow up on that. So how do I know when we're finished? Just say so? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the second question. All right, and for those of you who are engaged, what is the most valuable contribution that I have made to help you? And if, if oh yeah, sure. Do you want me to read them? Yeah. Okay, all right. The first, the first one, number A, is provide feedback on relevance of the trial question to the patients. B is ensure that eligibility criteria are broad and inclusive. C, provide patient-friendly language suggestions for informed consent document and educational materials. And the last one, identify potential barriers to patient interest and ability to participate and complete the trial. All of the above. Yeah. All of the above. I guess, I guess, well, you know, that's good. I should have included that one too, but I was, I didn't think anybody would have all of them, <laughs> but that's great news. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, 
surprisingly, I don't see anything on B. That really does surprise me. Not that I'm trying to coerce you, but I'm very surprised by that. All right. And I, I think my colleague is taking a picture of these, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks, because I can't see you from here. There's a post between you and me. Oh, there's somebody gave you a piece. Oh, good. <laughs> that was you. Oh, well, you know what? I, I think you can only pick one thing, right? Yeah, really okay, one thing. well, that's okay. Next time we'll know. Live and learn. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on now. So the last question oh, yeah. is for those of you who aren't engaged very often or, or just every so often, I'd like to understand what some of the barriers might be for you. So I've picked some that I think could be there. Number A is time constraints. Number two is no established relationship with patient advocate. C would be not sure to, how to start collaborating with the patient advocate. And D is unclear on the benefits of working with the patient advocate. So think about those and tell me what you are struggling with. So maybe the, the reason that there aren't hardly any answers is because so many of you are so well engaged. Is that it? <laughs> okay, thank you so much for bearing with me, everybody. This thank you. Great. Thank this you very much. Fun. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you to our tech team for getting that sorted out. Sorry. We'll have Dr. Heskes come up and give an update. All right, there we go. We just push it right here. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so, a quick update on uh, community engagement. Uh, we have been quite active and uh, have been involved in a number of different activities. Um, so, again, <clears throat> I think our, our main charge is to really try to help the loan committee uh, by really reaching out to community based um, oncologists and um, I think they're really were involved throughout the uh, development process uh, from uh, the initial uh, concepts through development, through submission, and then hopefully if they're approved uh, through the actual execution of the trials. So, uh, so we've continued to be involved in, in these uh, various phases of development and hopefully uh, the perceptions and the uh, input that we've provided have proven useful uh, to the study teams developing these concepts. So um, our membership, uh, we've actually expanded as we've gotten busier. So we have uh, three new members. Um, Suzanne Cole has, uh, has left our group because uh, she basically had some other commitments, but we're very grateful for the help that she uh, supported us with. And in addition to the basic uh, core subcommittee, um, very, very important is, is a uh, so-called community oncology support group. So these are individuals that are, are uh, helping us. They participate uh, every month in our, our monthly calls. They provide very, very valuable input. And um, it's really been great because uh, some of these individuals have gotten very, very engaged. And, and some of them have actually gone on to become uh, members on the subcommittee. I would push right now to say that for those that potentially are interested in, in this issue and are sort of community-based, um, I would like to expand uh, this list so please, if one has interest, just uh, I'll show you my email at the end, but please just send me an email because I think the wider the group that we can get, the more input that we'll have you know, to provide uh, to the folks developing studies. <clears throat> so um, ongoing activities, as I said, we're involved in all steps of protocol development and execution. We have our monthly meetings, um, working again with our larger group of uh, community oncologists and I think one of the really interesting things that we've done recently is that we've been inviting study PIs for trials that are in development to actually come and present uh, during the monthly meetings. And I think that's been really, really helpful because I think we give them a, a perspective, again, that perhaps may not be the same as in their smaller bubbles. Um, it's sometimes not what they wanna hear, um, but I think that's important. And so, uh, so it's really, it's proved to be a very, very useful thing. And, and I'm getting increasing requests uh, from uh, PIs that have study concepts to present at our meetings. And I think it's really helpful. Um, 
and uh, and we can provide Janelle and the other lung committee leaders with uh, this this feedback. The other thing that's been very very um, helpful is in our partnership with the MedNet. Again, uh, I suspect many of you have probably um, been interacting with the MedNet, but it's a web-based um, educational program uh, designed uh, for cancer providers. And it's really been a forum that we've been able to put out concepts. They've been working very closely with the Lung Committee specifically. We can put out concepts that we, they can query uh, the uh, people that are on the site in terms of what they think about this concept. Uh, they can talk about some of the active studies and they've done a lot of very, very interesting thing. And we've also been involved with the, the Lung Committee's DEI initiatives. So again, very briefly on the MedNet, uh, it's a private digital platform, puts clinical questions out there, um, has over 13,000 oncology members. So it's a really incredibly large forum um, that allows access to many, many people in a, in a very user-friendly way. And so uh, we've done a lot of things with the MedNet. We're really grateful to them. Uh, Liza Henry has been our member of our committee, uh, who's the medical director uh, of the MedNet. We've been reaching out to NCOR sites. We've been highlighting some of our key studies. We've been getting feedback. We've actually, they've had journal clubs. And again, uh, really what's very important going forward will be initiatives relating to pragmatic alone. I think that's the perfect setting to use this kind of forum. Uh, to get information out about that study. And so in terms of uh, 2302 Pragmatic Alone, um, this, again, uh, they've just launched an, a new program to raise awareness about this. And um, in the first 24 hours, they had 157 oncologists that actually sought information uh, based upon seeing this on the MedNet. So it's very, very important. We've also been working uh, with our um, our lung uh, DEI uh, champion, uh, Lucy Gangsauer, uh, who I think is following me uh, on the podium. And uh, she has been uh, a tremendous resource. And we've been doing a number of different efforts uh, looking at trying to include or expand uh, our, our uh, diversity of our clinical trial enrollment. And so uh, she's been doing some work looking at analytical innocent cases and clinical trial accrual information at different sites based on race and ethnicity. Uh, we've been looking at best practices. And I think very exciting is a recent proposal that uh, Lucy has helped develop to do some geographically focused um, efforts outreach um, as a demonstration project for pragmatic lung. I think she may speak to this uh, somewhat, but it's a very, very exciting concept. And, and we think uh, we're very excited about that. Um, so again, uh, that is my brief presentation. This is my email. And again, I would reach out to anyone who thinks they might be interested in participating in these, uh, this process to sort of let me know, uh, because we certainly have capacity to have more people on our monthly calls, and it'll just provide us a greater diversity of input. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's perfect. And off to Lucy. Well, that was a great introduction, and thank you. Uh, working with the Community Engagement Committee has just been phenomenal. And yesterday, we got great input from that group because there were several sites that had actually enrolled in Pragmatica, and we found that people aren't used to pragmatic trials coordinators. They're used to these very detailed and what wonderful feedback and so timely. So I encourage you to get engaged with that committee. First thing I wanted to show is this graph and I'll let Dr. Gray really speak to it because it's her work and your work, not really mine. <laughs> Yeah, so we just wanted to um, show people about the participants here that are registering for our studies and showing that we do have great participation from our NCORP sites. And these are sites that are where our community is. We have the leader of one of our, our NCORP leaders here. And so I think that the, the one of the purposes of putting this up here is to show that when we think about the trials and how to bring trials to the patients, Practical trials is something that we've heard back over and over again is something that we need to keep at the forefront of what we're doing, okay? And so it really takes a whole team to get us to these accruals, to reach the patients, to, again, drive that impact and answer those key questions together. So just wanted you to keep that in mind as we're designing these trials. And the reason I threw that in my presentation is that report of study, which all of you get, 
It's about 600 pages. And I'm sure there's not a lot of you that have time to go through that. This data that I'm showing you here came out of that really comprehensive report of studies data. And it's showing how we have a gap still in lung committee and kind of comparing us to the other large disease sites. And so I'm going to be focusing to begin with, with Pragmatica, really trying to see if I can work in the areas where we have a lot of African-American populations among our community and force to see if we can move that number on African-Americans. And then next we will be looking at the Hispanic population. But we need to come up with a good target number for that because we know in many areas of the country, uh, the Hispanic population is a younger influx and they've not really aged up enough to have cancer. For example, where I used to work, our community had 9% Hispanics, our tumor registry had 1%. Everybody I know is starting to get into the process of thinking about the upcoming grant. And there's two nice documents that are out there that kind of give some insights. And particularly, uh, you see the budget that went through, and then you see the National Cancer Plan. And so when you look at the goals, there's two goals that are particularly of interest to us is number fun for eliminating and equities and disparities. And I think SWAG has been on the forefront of doing that, but we know we have to do more. And then engaging every participant in research and that every participant has the ability to be included. So those are things that we need to embed in everything we do. In the budget, one of the things that was uh, submitted, now this has not been approved, is doubling accruals to clinical trials and including a more diverse pool of participants. So you're seeing these trends that we assume will be in our upcoming application. And then I like the last one, which I think is, in my opinion, speaking to Pragmatica, re-envision and redesign clinical trials with a focus on achieving faster progress, new trial design with an increased access for underserved populations. That's the major goals that uh, Dr. Redcamp will be talking about later. I just wanna remind everybody as SWAG is preparing, we're gonna be sending out membership surveys. We need every single one of you at your sites to complete that and try to complete it timely when they come out. Pragmatica lung, I'm going to talk a little bit about that from the disparities focus, is FDA has actually submitted a whole guidance, and that came out April 22, and talking about diversity plans to improve enrollment. On Pragmatica, we actually received back that study and was asked to uh, meet up our plan. And so you'll see a very, in the protocol, in section 18.8, you'll see a very comprehensive plan on how we're going to achieve enrolling diverse populations. And there's a lot of support. Frank is leading a team that is working to provide support to the sites and materials for physicians and patients. And we're going to be engaging diverse populations. That's going to be my initial focus in the Southeast particularly with community sites. We're also, as Judy talked about, connecting with those patient advocacy groups. We're going to be focusing on community engagement. And then most of all, we're going to be recognizing you for your efforts and trying to identify best practices and barriers and continue to ensure that this trial is successful and a lot of monitoring and feedback. I want to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. You know, very lucky to have Paul and Lucy as part of the team. And I, I can't underscore that enough. They have been so instrumental in getting that patient voice uh, at the forefront as we're developing these protocols so we keep them as uh, feasible as possible. So I'm going to skim through this to try to catch up on some time. I'm going to pick on Dr. Lucky Lara, who just joined us. 
Um, and one of the things that we just want to spend a moment talking about, I'm kind of putting him on the spot a little bit here, is like, what's the vision for SWAG as a whole and accruals? Um, if you can maybe come to the microphone or if you want to come to the podium. Uh, this is something that we do need to think about. We highly encourage everyone to pay attention to the studies. When we bring the studies to the table to please give us feedback. If you think there's something that will um, make it impossible for you to open a trial at the site, we want to know about these things sooner rather than later and how can we reach more patients. Dr. Lara? So in order to, to serve uh, the diverse populations we have, we, we need to complete the studies that we activate yes. uh, representing all of those individuals with cancer or at risk of developing cancer in those trials. And um, uh, so the metrics that are imposed on us uh, include accrual, right? Yes. Just yes. the numbers alone are, mm -hmm. are one of the things we're responsible for. So the quantity of patients we bring into our clinical trials has to be at top of mind when we're developing these concepts. But that shouldn't stop there. We, are, we also need to think about the quality of those accruals. When I say that, I, I uh, you have to reflect on, is the study design going to change practice? Is it going to influence what you're going to be doing in the future? So designing studies that have modest or moderate impact should really not be the focus of this group. You know, we're at this level of drug or concept development where uh, you have an opportunity to actually change yes. things in a dramatic way. So when we're designing studies, I'd like everyone to think about not just the accrual rate and the accrual numbers, but the quality of the patients and the quality of the trials yes. that we're accruing those patients into. Um, I said at another um, working group that uh, uh, ultimately what we'd like to have is a balanced portfolio of trials if not in SWOG, within this, uh, within the lung committee, when what I mean by a balanced portfolio is a a, a, um, a group of studies that include pragmatic, quote unquote, real world studies, as well as those as well as those trials that we've been doing all along. You know, these studies that have TM, PRO, quality of life studies, the the studies where we have these um, uh, additional opportunities for folks to investigate the impact of an intervention on the patients we treat. Yes. Uh, but we can't have those trials prioritized uh, inordin inordinately over, say, pragmatic okay. studies right. like lung pragmatica. We need to have a balanced yes. portfolio. Right. And then finally, I think, um, although a lot of us want to do uh, studies with brand new drug X in combination with IOY, uh, in many ways, those types of studies are probably best done by our industry partners, yes. right? And and so there are studies that are best suited for us. Uh, doing four registration studies, they're fine to do, but probably not the kind of uh, uh, studies that we should be highly prioritizing. Right. There are many other scientific questions Agreed. that the cooperative group taxpayer-funded system um, should be able to do. So... So I encourage everyone to just think uh, yes. broadly about the quality and the quantity of uh, of trials that we do and the patients we put onto them. Yeah, I think, and thank you for that. I think that's a excellent, excellent point, especially about thinking about how we balance our portfolio. We and we struggle with this in the lung committee, and and Karen, Dr. Reckamp knows this very well, right? When we're developing Pragmatica, you know, um, Rick Pazder told us many times if you're not uncomfortable designing this study, then you're doing something wrong. And we got lots of questions and you hear about this more about add this, add this, add that, no, 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 right? We have one question. We also then have trials, like we just had Dr. Mack up here talking about, where we we want to take those deeper dives into the data. So having that balance, right, is something I think that is definitely a vision for us moving, moving forward and having, again, driving forward with impact. Uh, Fred? So I have a comment to uh, Lucky. Um, I have been analyzing, I'm in a big institution in New York, and I've been analyzing over accrual in relation to over population. And uh, realize that a lot of our patients have poor performance status mm. and will not be included in current in clinical trials. trials. So I wonder uh, whether Sv uh, Svog have a, and strategy around 
Th that could be simple trials, mm -hmm. which could be easy to accrue to and actually make a change in the treatment landscape because we don't have much evidence-based mm -hmm. guided therapy for patients in poor performance status. So uh, that might be something to... Yes, absolutely. I agree. And I think we're going to have a panel discussion um, focused on Pragmatica. And I think those um, uh, specifically on that on that is a topic on eligibility. So you bring up some very good questions, not only performance status, but some other items that we can look at. All right, great. And with that, I think we'll transition to our keynote. Thank you very much. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Um, Karen Kelly. She is um, on the board of directors. Uh, sorry, she's on the um, ISLAC. Uh, she's on CEO. She's a former board of director um, at ISLAC. She's a longstanding member also of SWOG and our former lung committee chair. She's recognized internationally for her expertise in lung cancer research. And her career has been dedicated to providing enhanced cancer care through cutting edge clinical trials. Dr. Kelly's lung cancer research has involved all aspects of the disease uh, from risk reduction to screening to treatment. And she has been at the forefront of drug development to treat lung cancer throughout her career. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Kelly. Thank you all. All righty. Well, it is certainly my pleasure. I don't know whether I can take this down just a little bit because I don't think you guys can see me if I, if I all right, let me just do this, okay. So thank you, thank you so much. Maybe I'll stand so over nice. uh, on this side here. All right. <laughs> so it is truly an honor and a privilege to be giving the Robert B. Livingston lecture today. Dr. Livingston was the SWOG lung chair when I started my career many, many years ago. And when he offered me the opportunity to be the PI of SWOG S9509, and for those of you that do not remember what that is or are really too young to remember what it is, it is was a phase three clinical trial of cisplatin and venerelvine versus paclitaxel and carboplatin. Just think of how far we have come with me saying that and how old I really am. Uh, nonetheless, it was such a tremendous opportunity that I was so grateful for his mentorship, his belief in me, and I've never forgotten that. And as I now have stepped into his shoes and Dr. Gandhara's shoes, as your swag passed a lung chair, I was really committed to paying that forward and to ensuring that I could give the same opportunity to as many young people that I could. And it is such a joy to work with all of them in this committee because I see many of them here. So I do not have anything to close, to, to disclose, but as I have now moved on into this role as the CEO, the SWOG Lung Committee Chair and being part of SWOG has really helped me prepare for this new role. Now to think about conquering a lung cancer, not only nationally, but now globally. So with that, uh, you all already know that lung cancer is the second most frequently diagnosed cancer throughout the world, and it is the number one cause of death, with 1.8 million deaths per year per the latest Globus scan in 2020. Now with that, if you look at this by gender, you can see that the incidence of lung cancer in men is uh, almost equal to that of prostate cancer as the number one most frequently diagnosed. But in women, of course, as we heard earlier today, it's breast cancer and cervical cancer worldwide. But then when you start looking at the mortality rates, you see that blue just take over, particularly for men, but you do see significant amount of blue showing that uh, the reason why lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death uh, throughout the world. Now, when we think about cancer or we think about things on a global scale, we divide them into their economic statuses. And so high and low and middle. And the most important piece of information on this slide is that 70% of cancer deaths are occur in the low and middle income countries. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. They don't have any resources to make the diagnosis early. They make it late. 
And then in addition to that, they do not have any effective therapies. Now, recently there was an article in JAMA Oncology forecasting the global economic burden of cancer uh, over the next 30 years. And here again, you know, we continue to be in that top spot that we don't really want to be into, but we are in the top uh, across most of, or at least half of the world, as being the number one economic burden of cancer. And when you look at it by actual the numbers and by the metrics, you see here that by all of the metrics, uh, bi billions of dollars, percent of the total GDP, and per capita loss, there's a clear demarcation between lung cancer and the next cancer, which is colorectal cancer. So uh, here again, we, we hold this top spot that we really do not want to hold. And this is really important because the forecast is that we will see a 30% increase in lung cancer mortality by 2030. And most of this, of course, is occurring in Asia. Now, that is in contrast to what we all know is occurring in the United States, where every year we see the cancer statistic numbers and we know that mortality rate is going down. Here's the forecast for 2030 showing a 20% reduction in mortality. And this, of course, is due to the national uh, priority, commitment, financial commitment to cancer research, to cancer treatment, and to prevention. And we have to applaud uh, doc, uh, Dr. Biden, President Biden, for reinitiating the Cancer Moonshot Program for the new National Cancer Plan. But we are not alone in understanding that we have to reduce cancer mortality, particularly when you see these types of numbers. Uh, the WHO, the UN, all are also committed and putting dollars in. So while these are projections, you know, I'm going to say that they're also motivators for us to really now take a stand against not only lung cancer, but cancer in general. Now, I will say that one of the many lessons learned by COVID is that the world is a really a very small place and we're all very interconnected. And that when you are faced with a crisis and you come together, you can accelerate solutions to the crisis as we saw. So lung cancer is a global crisis and we need to come together to accelerate its solutions. And so just a few stories uh, that global research is really just necessary for us to have a, a better understanding of cancer biology. And I wanna use the example of the EGFR story. Now, many, many years ago, uh, I did participate in IDEAL 2, but IDEAL 1 was an international clinical trial that was looking at response rates in two doses of gefitinib, 250 and 500. And from that trial, the overall response rate was about 18%. But when you looked at it by the Japanese and the non-Japanese, you saw this incredible, almost triple the response rate in the Japanese patients. Now, that, of course, was very exciting and said, well, there must be something biologically different going on here and motivated our laboratory researchers to really take a more deeper dive look into this potential biological difference. And this is when the EGFR mutation was discovered. But you see here that it was really in these Japanese samples that we had. And so you, you then see that going from the the bedside to the bench and back to the bedside, that IPASS was conducted. And we saw that for the very first time, an oral agent really uh, be beneficial over a platinum doublet. And this now is the birth of precision medicine and targeted therapy. If we had just done this study in the United States, this drug probably would have been abandoned. We probably never, or I won't, I won't say never, but it would have taken us a long time to figure this out. 
And I have an excerpt here from that science paper. So back in 2004, to where they really say that this differences that they saw really does argue for looking at population diversity, ethnic, cultural, geographic in our cancer clinical trials back in uh, 2004. Now, I would say that it's not just about looking at diversity in our clinical trials, but also in laboratory research. So fast forward to two days ago when the first publication came out looking at the human pan genome, which is looking at now 47 uh, human genomes having that diversity in the genome, which I think is just going to be revolutionary as we go forward. Now, there are other ways that global research, so that's cancer biology, but what about actually impacting treatment? And this is just an example of how conducting research with the support in this case of the NIH has really revolutionized uh, feasibility of treatments worldwide. And this is the story that I'm sure you all, all know about, which is that of the HPV vaccine showing that one dose versus two or three dose is uh, just as good as those two and three and really has now taken on worldwide adoption. And of course, anytime you have something that's one dose, easy to give, cheap, that's probably a gold standard for, for us. So, so that is really important to know that there's many ways that global research can be beneficial. And then finally, I just wanna point out that even though we live here in the United States, we do not have unlimited resources to do research. And so we have to really, if we can't have them participate or we can't support research in other countries, we have to encourage research in other countries. And this is an example of the fact that, as I said, we can't do everything here in the United States, and there are some tumors we'd like to know more about, but we just don't have the resources. And so we have to encourage those countries that see these types of diseases to really do the work for us so that the world can benefit. And this is an example of head and neck cancer to where in the United States, we don't see all that many cases, but worldwide, it's a problem. And so we have to rely on our worldwide partners because unfortunately, we're gonna be seeing an increase in head and neck cancer. And if we can be prepared by using the great work that our global partners do, we're all gonna be better off. And so just wanting to really show you how important it is to really embrace global research. Now, getting back to lung cancer, this is just a high level summary of lung cancer by modality. And the first thing you will note here is that curative intense surgery plays a role across all stages of disease, all right? not just stage one, not just stage two, but even in stage four, when we know that when you resected a single adrenal met, you know that five-year survival is improved and we have perhaps even cured patients. Now, my next question was, well, how many thoracic surgeons do we have worldwide? And so I went to PubMed and I, I looked through PubMed and I started making my list and then I got very frustrated because I couldn't find the information that I really wanted. And so I asked ChatGBT if they knew, and they really didn't know either the number, but I think what they have said here really does apply in, in fact that uh, there is diversity, da, da, da. But what I was very encouraged by was that when I was going through all of these articles, which was really one by one, and they were trying to look at thoracic surgeons and the needs, is that every one of them said that we need more thoracic surgeons, and I'm sure thoracic surgeons would agree with that, because we know even in the United States, many of our surgeons surgeries are done by general surgeons, and we know that really the quality of surgical resection is with our thoracic surgeons. So every one of these articles, though, did say we have to develop a plan, so I was very encouraged by that, and uh, hopefully that we can uh, see more thoracic surgeons, particularly as we have more CT screening. So 
a similar story for radiation. Radiation curative intent radiation therapy crosses every stage of disease that we have, all right? And in addition, radiation therapy plays a very important role in palliation of symptoms. Now, there's a little bit more information. It's indirect, and this map is that of machines. And this is a study looking at uh, how many radiation therapy machines are there between 2022 and 2012. 20, um, and the red, and you may not be able to read this, but the red is the only sites where the, the number of machines meet the demand, everything else. And the dark blue is really a high deficit. All the others are deficits. And you can read the uh, bold there. But what this article title was, was have we made any progress and the author concluded that, yes, we have made progress. It has been modest. So I hope that somebody will now be publishing the next 10 years, which ended in 2022, to see if we've made more progress. And I'm, I'm hoping that we have made more progress in this as well. Now, where we really have had an explosion of uh, new advances have been on the systemic side. And here you see, I've just tried to list them. I apologize if I've missed some. Not only do we have so many new drugs, we have so many new drug combinations. We've now gone from doublets to triplets to quadruplets. Our therapies now span from late stage disease to early stage disease. Lung cancer has really become a very complicated disease, um, but also a more precise disease, more optimizing treatment. But there's you know, pros and cons to all of that. But when you think about this in low and middle income countries, of course, uh, it actually can be very depressing. Again, my heart breaks when I know that we cannot deliver the right surgery, the right radiation, and the right uh, drugs to all patients with this disease. And this was spoken about earlier today in the plenary session about the WHO Essential Medicine list. Now, low and middle income countries do use this as guidance to place drugs on their formulary. This is a very rigorous process that drugs go through. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the only drugs that are really on the list, not only for lung cancer, but all cancers are really cytotoxic chemotherapy, uh, or lotnib, uh, maybe gefitinib are, are on this list, but that is it. And this is the list from 2020. So uh, FYI about that. Now, ESMO has really been trying to get, do a deeper dive in understanding this issue. And this is one of their online surveys, and this is one of the first surveys looking at the essential medicine list. And you can see, no surprise here, that for low and middle income countries, that if there are drugs available, you have to pay for them at full price. And that even sometimes, when you have a drug uh, that's available, it may not be accessible, meaning there's a drug shortage, a la the United States now with this platinum. So now we are feeling the pain that they feel every day. So FYI. In an updated survey that ESMO did and presented at uh, the annual meeting last year, uh, they looked at more novel agents, and I was able to pull out the information for the one agent that they looked at, the one class of agents that they looked at, and that was the EGFR TKIs. I don't think you can uh, read this, or maybe maybe you can, but this is about cost and availability on this slide, and you can see the marked differences between the high income and the low and middle income, where the gray is the drugs aren't even available to uh, the, the country, to the patients, and if they are available, they really cost a lot of money. And then this slide is really about accessibility, meaning you you write the prescription, you hand it to the patient, can you get the drug? Uh, well, in the United States and high income countries, yes, you can, but you can see that over there in the red, no, never, 
never, you have a prescription, but you can never get it. And that has to do again with drug supply shortages or uh, it, it just can't get there. So there's lots of reasons for that, but still the gray of not being available persist. Now, at this point, you all may be very disappointed and very depressed. Uh, but my point here is to just show you, we have to understand what is happening before we can come up with solutions. So instead of being depressed, I want you to be motivated. We have a lot of work to do, and each and every one of you can play a role in that work. So as I said, as I was thinking about this, I was going, mm, this, this could be perceived as being very depressing. But it is what it is. And we now need to go and ask ourselves, what can we, what can SWOG do? You know, today, we're not going to change health policies in countries overnight. That's a very long-term goal. But what can we do to be helpful? And one of the things that we can do, it was talked about the plenary session, is to have countries participate in our clinical trials. And there are many advantages to that, and it solves a lot of our problems. So I think there is really shared mutual benefit here. First of all, from our side of the fence, slow accrual that we've been talking about, lack of patient diversity that we've been talking about, and these trials are expensive. Well, low and middle income countries, they're eager to enroll into clinical trials. The majority of the world is in the low and middle income countries. All right, 84% increase our diversity, and they do, just by their nature, would have a lower cost structure. In addition, the additional benefit to the low and middle income countries is that they do have then access. We can help them with access to the drugs. Now, I want to be careful here because access to drugs on a clinical trial is great, but we have to remember there are some other downstream events, as is talked about today. It's not just the drug. There are other issues here that also need to be addressed. And then secondly, we can help them build that very important research infrastructure. So I think that there, this is a win-win situation. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is possible. And of course, you already know that because SWOG already does it. I do want to also say that uh, access to clinical trials, and this slide was shown this morning. I, I put uh, the breast cancer data showing that here's the incidence of breast cancer and cervical cancer, but that doesn't match the clinical trial where the clinical trials are. And those of you who are cancer center leaders know that you must match your clinical trials to your, cancer, to your catchment area. In this case, the catchment area really is the entire world. So there is some good news here, and that is that over the past many years, about a decade, we have increased participation globally of adding global sites. And this is a recent publication as well, looking at 636. So that's a lot of randomized clinical trials to where low and middle income countries have been participating. So we can do this. Now, I think the key here is that we need to be able to learn lessons and expand. It's typically there's just kind of go to low and middle income countries. We need to expand that to other countries. So that was just my key message on this slide. And as I've already mentioned, so excited that SWOG has for a long time been committed to international participation. And I put up here uh, at the I Check It trial, <laughs> which is uh, really accruing uh, fabulous and does have that international participation. But I do want to say within the lung group specifically, you many of you may not know this, but S0819 did have participation from Latin America countries. And I'm really excited. I did not know this until I looked that S1827 and my trial 1914 will also now have international participation. I tried to get this accomplished during my tenure, but I was not able to do that. So perseverance. <laughs> 
Perseverance is a good thing, as we all know, uh, in our um, SWAG One committee. And then just one quick word about Pragmatica. I do think Pragmatica, here again, I want to applaud SWAG and, the, and the, all the SWAG partners, the NCI, the FDA, about really leading the way forward here. This is such a great trial. It's answering a very important clinical question, but it's also addressing, I would say, these traditional barriers to lung cancer, accrual to the lung cancer process, to being more efficient. And I'm so happy that we're addressing this. This trial is jam-packed with a lot of first. And so I'm going to keep a close eye on this because this trial really is a model for low and middle income countries. And I think the icing on the cake here, though, is if we could really have international participation in Pragmatica Lung, and hopefully we can discuss this in a few minutes. Now, to me, the best treatment for advanced stage lung cancer is no treatment, meaning that we shouldn't be diagnosing patients in advanced stage lung cancer. We need to be diagnosing patients in early stage disease. We can do this, all right? This would be the single most important thing that we could do globally is to shift the diagnosis from late stage to early stage. And we can do that by CT screening. It is well established now, in addition to tobacco control. This is the current status of CT screening worldwide. I will say that as of last week, Australia announced that they will be implementing a national lung screening program. So that this is now eight countries. There are several countries that have implementation research going on and clinical trials going on. This is very critical for their own countries so that they can use this data to help them get a national screening program. So this is also very important. And uh, I want to say that from the IASLC pers perspective, we have been participating along with a lot of global organizations in a lung cancer policy network where we are committed to really trying to enhance and get more low-dose CT screening out there. And we recently published our new framework platform, and we're excited to now begin to work with countries who think that they are uh, can actually implement the program. And so we'll be working with them to try to see if we can help them implement a CT screening program. It's kind of a grassroots effort, but well worth it. And finally, I just want to say in summary it, that we have made substantial advances. It's just been an incredible journey. As I said, I went from cisplatinum, venerol, being paclitaxel, carboplatinum to, to now. And who knew and whoever thought that this would, would be the case. It's, it's such an exciting time. But it's also, again, a heartbreaking time when we know that we have unequal access to these new treatments worldwide. We are all in this world together and we really need to help each other. And it is disturbing that we see that uh, mortality rate uh, perhaps increasing to, to, uh, by 20, 20, uh, 2030. So what we can do today is we can take a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder approach. What we can do today is we can get participation of our international sites. We can help our colleagues implement CT screening. We can expand tobacco programs as well. While we, in parallel, work to uh, really change national policies uh, worldwide. And I do just want to spend one minute, if possible, if possible, just um, as I wear this new hat of the CEO of the IASLC, we are undergoing strategic planning, and we recognize that our biggest challenge is that we have unequal access to research, to education, 
to treatment worldwide. And so when you see the new strategic plan coming at the World Conference, you will see throughout the strategic plan our increased dedication and commitment to these three areas truly on a worldwide scale. But in order for us to do that, everybody in this room, and I should, Roy's back there taking pictures. So everybody in this room, I need your help for us to accomplish this. So I think our plan is going to be awesome. I think there's such great opportunities. And I think when you see visions come to fruition, that is, it, it, it's just a feeling that you can't ever describe but I can only do this with all of you. So I really look forward to working with all of you in a different realm. I will be coming back because I love you guys so much and uh, always interested in your success. And you ha it's been an honor to be the lung chair in the past, but you're in good hands with uh, Janelle and the rest of the team and all of you. So thank you so much. It's been my privilege. Absolutely marvelous. So I think we have a question at the mic. You talked about global equity and opportunities. You know, America is still selling tobacco products in the third world. Yeah. Should we not take a lead in trying to stop that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I enjoyed your talk. It brought me back to the ideal one and two trials, which <laughs> I too remember. Quick question. So all these years, has anyone figured out on a global level, why do Japanese uh, patients have more, and Asian patients have more EGFR mutant lung cancer. Is, with, is that something that the organization maybe can do with large databases and AI and try to figure that out? Um, I, I think the answer to that is yes. And I think you'll see some bold initiatives, as you know, Roy. Um, yes, but I do think we do have that new hinge with the work by Charlie Swanton that yeah. pollution may be playing a role here. So I think, you know, technology is a beautiful thing. And I think we're, we will get to the answer to that. Great. Thanks. But there is some, some at least signals. Hey, Fred. Karen, you gave a wonderful talk and you pointed to the right things. Um, however, what is left behind is what is the solution to uh, the problems on the global uh, scale and particularly uh, I learned when we were at LALCA how difficult it is for many countries to get access yeah. to new drugs. Yeah. So here is my comment. I think uh, it is a task for ISLC to engage in a communication with the industry. I think the industry partners can play a really significant role to help filling in this gap. And I think ISLC should, uh, I'm sure you do already, but uh, the communication with industry partners to, they can provide drugs to under underserved countries in, in, a, in, in a different ways, I think. Yeah. So, Fred, you're absolutely right. Let me just expand upon that comment. First of all, I will say that um, our industry partners are really critical, and we have started what's called a corporate roundtable, and all of our industry partners are engaged in that. It's, it's three months old, but they're very engaged, and on our list of high-priority topics are things like testing, access to drugs, CT screening. But again, we're brand new, but we have a vision. We have a mission set before us. And I would say that the headquarters staff 
are doing a phenomenal job building those relationships. In fact, we have partners that kind of want to join in the middle of the, the partnership. And so we'll probably let them do that because they, they're so wanting to be helpful. So I think that is step one. But it's not as easy as just to say, give us the drug. There is a lot of other things that we need to work on as well. And that, first of all, is truly understanding where the barriers are. Are. So you will see in the new strategic plan that it's that it's about partnering with the industry, but also utilizing and leveraging their policy uh, expertise, as well as the policy expertise of others worldwide, the who, the partnerships that we can build, then ministries that we can uh, start to engage in a relationship that says, we want to help you, not in a relationship that says, why are you not doing this? So we want to say, how can we help you? What do you need? How can we work with you? But it's not just um, industry. It's not just ISLC. There's a lot of, of partners that we need to pull this off. And if we engage the health ministries early on, from the very beginning, we feel that that's going to also be a better strategy. So my point, Fred, is, is I think we're on the right path there, uh, but it is complicated. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. Um, so, yeah. So basically, um, I basically I come from Egypt and I was uh, heavily involved with ERTC clinical mm -hmm. trials like Topazikin with small cell lung cancer. It was very easy to have clinical trials and patient participants at that time in the 1990s. However, since the start of EGFR directed therapies and tissue mandated mm -hmm. clinical trials, it was the main barrier. Mm -hmm. And since then, all clinical trials stopped from there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the site when uh, I was at NCI Cairo and uh, we had uh, ERTC and SWOG, I think long time ago, but everything stopped with the mandation of tissue and liquid biopsy. Mm -hmm. So these are very expensive, of course. So I think if we are directing uh, attention to drugs, sometimes those drugs can be available, but also we don't know uh, which patients should be treated with which drugs if we don't have the correct mm -hmm. diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, actually that is our, the number one priority from the corporate roundtable. And we have a few pilot projects that will be addressing the issue uh, and barriers of NGS testing in a different way than what we have been doing. So what we've been doing right now is just looking at NGS testing in certain points along the pathway. We're looking at it from the pathologist. We're only looking at it from the provider. We're only looking at it from one point. We have to look at it across the whole system, not just at one point. So we want to be more out of the box thinking because how we've been thinking about NGS testing or any biomarker testing, in my opinion, has, has just been in isolation and not looking at it from the entire loop of the patient gets the diagnosis and then gets to the drug. So, so we need to look at it, the entire process uh, to really understand because you're only as good as your weakest link and you need to know what that link is because we, we don't think it's the pathologist. We don't think it's the provider. We, it's within the hospital system is, is where that weak link is. And we need to identify it and then work with the hospitals or health systems, whatever, to be able to uh, find the solutions to that. And we know that, gosh, health systems are so different. So we want to pilot some of this in various different countries. So I think we're on the right path. But please, if anyone has any great, wonderful ideas, now that you're all with me, you're all with me now, <laughs> that uh, we can uh, work together. So thank you again. Thank you so very much. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. That was outstanding. All right. So we'll invite Dr. Karen Reitkamp to just give us a high level over high level overview of Pragmatic Along. We spoke about this at our last meeting and heard a more detailed talk, and then we'll go right into our um, our panel discussion in about five minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, everybody's heard a lot about this study. 
um, over the last few days, and um, we're happy that it is finally open and uh, starting to accrue. Um, so again, it's Pragmatica Lung, and it's a prospective randomized trial of ramucirumab and pembrolizumab versus standard of care. My co-chair is Dr. Dragnev from Alliance, and our statistical chair is Mary Redman, and our study champions, Wade Imes and Brian Hennick, and our community engagement subcommittee representative is Dan Kerzosa. So here we see the schema, and again, this is the goal is to be a simple pragmatic trial that is aimed at answering one question, overall survival. And we look at patients who've had prior immunotherapy and chemotherapy, and they're randomized to either standard of care, which is not pre-subscribed, but um, based on NCCN guidelines and what the investigator would normally do for their patient versus the, uh, the investigational arm, which is ramucirumab and pembrolizumab. And the primary endpoint is overall survival. We expect 700 patients. And just a little bit of background on why this study works the way it does. So first off, this is in a group of patients who don't have optimal therapy. We use immunotherapy for most patients with um, non-small cell lung cancer. And even though there are some prolonged uh, benefits for patients and prolonged survival, most will have tumor progression and need other therapies. And we, when we get to those other therapies, we're still with FDA approved uh, ramucirumab and docetaxel or docetaxel alone for the most part. So S1800A was presented last year at ASCO, was the randomized phase two study of ramucirumab and pembrolizumab versus standard of care. And um, we had a significant improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and an improvement of 14.5 months for the combination arm and 11.6 months for the standard of care arm. But this was not thought to be um, robust enough to move this to the standard of care. And so um, a phase three trial was thought to be needed. And then we looked at this study and really said, we want to answer the question of survival. So can we do this in a way that gets rid of all the other information and just looks at survival? And the other important thing is that these drugs are, have been used in many diseases, in many, many patients, and we know about the toxicity of the drugs. So really, we wanted to reduce the burden of clinical trial participation for patients and promote more uh, broad uh, inclusion into the study and also decrease the burden on sites. And this is just a reminder, I'm just going to click through this to show you the improvement in overall survival, the improvement was seen across most subgroups. Um, and the imp other important piece is we did not see an improvement in the median progression-free survival. So this is also informing this phase three trial where we're not going to look at progression or um, response rate. And this is just reminding of the toxicity that overall we saw less toxicity with ramucirumab and pembrolizumab versus the chemotherapy arms in the standard of care. So based on that, again, we wanted to empower investigators to treat patients as they will would be in their real world practices. We want to decrease enrollment barriers and, and broaden the diversity of patients enrolled and minimize the data uh, collection, the burden of data, data collection. And really, we have one question that we're answering does this combination improve overall survival under the standard treatment um, conditions that we normally treat our patients under? Um, again, overall survival primary endpoint. Our secondary objective is to summarize serious and unexpected high grade, greater than grade three treatment related adverse events. So significant reduction in the normal uh, reporting of adverse events. The eligibility, this is a busy slide, but what the purpose of this is to understand that this is all of the eligibility uh, that's sitting on this slide. Importantly, it, it really defines this, this patient population. They have acquired resistance, so they have to have at least had stable disease or better on prior immunotherapy. They had to be on immunotherapy for at least 84 days, so not the primary resistant patients. They had to have at least um, prior immunotherapy and prior chemotherapy at some point. We are allowing patients who had neoadjuvant or adjuvant and have caveats for those patients, and patients who have received targeted therapy if they meet all the other criteria are potentially avail, uh, 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 eligible, and then we expanded the performance status to zero to two in this trial. 
Um, and again, the treatment and the standard of care is based on what the investigator would utilize. We point to the NCCN guidelines, knowing that the standard of care in the 700 tr patient trial might change over time. And so we acknowledge that and understand that that may be, um, it may be different in 2023 than in 2025. Um, and again, the drugs for ramucirumab and pembrolizumab are given as they were in S1800A, same doses every three weeks, and are provided um, through CTEP. The study calendar, again, the whole study calendar is shown here. We don't collect labs. We don't collect scans. We, those are expected to be done as, as your usual um, standard of care, but we aren't collecting them, and they're not required in this uh, piece. And we can talk a little bit about um, Paul Heskis has a lot of experience as he's entered a lot of patients that we have great coordinators and they look to the protocols as we teach them to. And when there's nothing in the protocol, there's a little bit of confusion. So we can talk about that. <laughs> um, the reporting requirements are significantly simplified. We have a reduction in the number of time points, the number of data fields, the number of forms. We don't collect tissue, we don't collect scans, and we don't collect uh, any patient reported outcome instruments. So this is a listing of all the forms you have here. And again, it's, it's really to show you how simplified this is. A little bit of um, the forms are, are shown here, the vital status form, which is the most important stu study form as it's uh, collecting um, survival. And adverse event reporting, again, high grade, greater than grade three, unexpected treatment related adverse events and all grade five adverse events. We do have treatment summaries, what the patient received on study, and, um, and then whether the patient is off treatment than the notice of death. Pathology, we, we require the, re the pathology report and the NGS PDL1 to be uploaded, and we have a simplified form to collect the specifics of that, but we don't have any tumor testing or tumor um, submissions, and there are no images that are required. Informed consent, we allow for um, remote informed consent in this study. We have um, in increased funding because this is a registrational trial, even though the burden on the site is probably less than um, most NCTN trials, regardless, uh, not even uh, registrational trials. As Lucy has uh, alluded to, we have enhanced recruitment, recruitment efforts. We have um, a firm that we're working with to monitor our recruitment. We're developing patient education, awareness, materials, social media, Spanish versions of all the patient content. We're engaging with our patient advocacy organizations um, and developing other materials and uh, conducting site support calls. And we'll have quarterly newsletters and recognize high accrual and uh, evaluate um, the diversity of our accrual. And again, this is, um, again, enhanced looking at representativeness. Um, we're going to be watching accrual over time and watching um, where we're seeing the underrepresented populations and provide uh, targeted outreach and support to those sites that have uh, more underrepresented uh, populations. We are looking to patient reimbursement. This is not something that uh, is in place yet, but we're looking to kind of the, the gift cards that allow for patients to get reimbursed without um, a lot of extra burden on the patients or the sites. And so that is a work in progress. Um, our resources, there are, um, again, plans to develop, develop and distribute enhanced set of resources. Um, plain, uh, patient friendly plain language trial summaries um, and uh, will be available on the CTSU site and a template for assistance with EMR uh, implementation also available. So I want to thank everybody who's been involved, um, the support from Merck and Lilly and our, um, our CT NCTN uh, partners, Alliance, ECOG, Akron, NRG. Foundation of uh, FNIH and Friends of Cancer Research, who started the, this with S1800A and has helped to move this along and get the support. All the support from SWAG and our operations, our data coordinators, our project manager, uh, Mariah, and, uh, and the team behind her that took over, and our project management team. And uh, we started to talk about this after ASCO, after the presentation, and this was opened in early March. 
we have, um, as of April 30th, the numbers are, um, there's about 185 sites open. Of those, over 100 are NCORP sites. And there's another 375 that are pending opening as of, as of April 30th. And we have about 14 enrollments as of April 30th. It's probably closer to 20 now. So 19. Very good. Thank you, Mary. So, um, so this is rapidly moving along and we appreciate the support and hope to help to the sites and the coordinators to understand how to best implement this. And we're learning along the way with everyone else. So thank you, everyone. So we have a poll, get your phones out. Ooh, making sure you're still awake. People are still already answering. How did you see this already? Have you opened enrollment for S2302 at your site? And I think, Paul, you can only answer once. <laughs> it's not for each enrollment. <laughs> so I'm sure the 186 sites are not here, but um, I don't know that we need to keep it. Clearly there's interest in this trial. I appreciate the interest and hope if you're not opening this trial that you will consider opening this trial. I think it fits for most of our patients and when they don't fit for other trials because they're lacking tissue or lacking other things, um, this is a relatively easy trial to um, get patients on. And I'm finding because we don't have labs or scans or EKGs, we can, I can actually break, talk with my coordinator and we can pre-do their eligibility as we're walking into clinic, getting ready to consent them. And so we're almost ready to enroll them while we're consenting them. Pretty impressive. All right, fantastic. Um, are there any barriers to opening at your site? Yep. Do we wanna wait for that? Yeah, yeah, okay. We can start having our panel come on up in the meantime. Those that are here. Harpreet and uh, Harpreet and Jeff, if you want to turn on your cameras, and I'm going to ask IT while we're waiting uh, for people to answer the poll, if we can pin Dr. Singh and Dr. Allen, please. Joining us virtually. So it's great to see that there are not barriers for most people. If there are barriers, please let us know. Um, we're happy to help with uh, trying to get this through, but the goal is to decrease barriers, and it looks like that is partly what we've done so far. So. Yeah. All right, perfect. I think we have lots of plenty of space here. Add in some chairs. So we're going to go off script a little bit. I asked Roy to Roy to join us on the panel up here. Okay, so we have um, uh, outstanding uh, presentations, and just wanted to thank Dr. Kelly again for that great segue and to talk about um, Pragmatica Lung. This has really been a labor of love for us uh, here. A lot of work, a lot of flurry, a lot of excitement, a lot of partnership uh, across the NCI FDA and uh, the Swag Cancer Research Network. So I'll start by uh, introducing our panelists. We have Dr. Karen Redkamp, she's the study chair and the director of the Division of Medical Oncology at Cedar sinai We have uh, Dr. Mary Redmond, she's our lead statistician of the Swag Lung Cancer Committee. We have Dr. Shakun Malik from the NCI. She's head of the Thoracic Cancer Therapeutics at uh, NCI CTEP. Online, joining us virtually, we have Dr. Harpreet Singh, the director of the Division of Oncology at the FDA. And we also have Dr. Jeff Allen. He's the president and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research. And we have Dr. Daniel Carrizosa, our SWOG Lung Community uh, Engagement Champion for this study. So really appreciate him uh, joining us, all of them joining us here today. So we'll just dive right in. Um, so I wanted to, to start off by asking Dr. Redman. Um, we just heard Dr. Redman kind of walk us through um, how we went from 1800 A um, over to Pragmatica uh, Lung. And so I wanted to see what you had to add to that. How was this conceptualized as a statistician and, and overseeing the operations of this, right? Um, if you could give us some of your feedback and thoughts and insights into that. It's a big question. I know, <laughs> I know. Start off with a biggie. Right. Well, I, I mean, the... Most of the time, well, whenever we're, I mean, when you're talking about the design of a study, um, obviously you want to design the study based on what the question is. And the data from S1800A said, we don't need to look at disease assessments. We don't need to look at, we we have a study 
um, investigational drug that has a pretty well-known toxicity profile and is in fact less toxic than standard of care. And so those very two simple objectives, we want to compare overall survival between the two arms mm -hmm. and we want to just uh, evaluate uh, treatment-related grade three unexpected serious adverse events within each treatment arm. And all of that says that, that the simplicity of what we need to collect, um, I mean, all of the information around the eligibility criteria, it just says all of those data requirements are reduced. It also says we want to have a relatively robust sample size mm -hmm. because there's yes. going to be heterogeneity across the right. patient population. Um, this different from most of our studies, we typically analyze just the subset that are determined to be eligible. Um, so every study, most of the studies you look at will have an accrual goal that inflates by 10% because we assume that about 10% of patients are not going to meet the eligibility. Mm -hmm. And so in this study, we are randomizing patients and we're going to analyze every patient that, in, that is enrolled. So that also increases the heterogeneity. So mm -hmm. the simplicity just led to a reduction in the, 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 the protocol is, is much shorter than the standard protocol that the instruments that we're using to collect all the information is much more streamlined. And it just, it's going back 20 years. It's what we used to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't here 20 years ago, <laughs> um, obviously, obviously. I, well, it's close to 20 years, but but I wasn't here 20 years ago. Um, and so that's really what it all all led led mm -hmm. to. Um, and and so and and as um for those of you who are in the TM uh, plenary yesterday, the Dr. Oath has talked about how if you design a study well, the analysis is boring. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very boring analysis, mm -hmm. which is great. <laughs> understood, understood. And expanding on that and thinking about that that data analysis, um, you know, Dr. Reckhans showed us those data forms, right? Thinking how, what were the key data considerations and how did you get those forms really pared down, right? To answer those questions. And what about the interconnectivity of the pragmatic design and those data collections, right? We're having questions from the sites about this. Um, where do we put this and this information? What do you think about that? I, I mean, I, so, there's a there's been a tendency over the years to try to collect more and more information, yeah. which is a huge burden on the sites. Mm -hmm. And there's and and one of the things like collecting concomitant medications and laboratory values and and there's always errors, and which means that there's always this back and forth between the our wonderful data coordinators and the sites trying to clean up the information. But when you have a very simple question, what you do is you, and you have a pragmatic design, is you look at the form and you say, do we absolutely need this piece of information? And if the answer is no, then you don't include it. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, and and chances are we might go too far. Right. Um, but that's okay because this is a test case. This is a what what happens if we really just look at as oh, just, just the essential oh, information. Right. And I'll tell you that um, by reducing the number of adverse events that sites have to report on, we're estimating that they're going to have to report it's like 10%, less than 10% of what they had to do in say 1800 wow. A. It's amazing. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. So the team, I think my point of these questions is there's, uh, there was a lot of work that went into being brief. This was not something that was easy to do. And I do want to also acknowledge that the NCI really helped us partner and we had to make sure that the data that was being collected, we didn't violate any guidelines, any mandates also. So it's simple, but also still follows guidelines. So it sounds easy, but um, you know, I think a lot of us know that brevity is not, not as easy. So I'm gonna shift to Dr. Redcamp. Um, you know, you and Dr. Dragnev are starting to, the sites are starting to open, you're getting these questions. Um, you alluded to in your talk about the study startup process of a site. And what are those considerations? What are the questions that you're seeing? And how do you, how are you navigating uh, the sites through a simple trial and getting questions that we didn't anticipate to actually get? We thought this was gonna be so straightforward, we're gonna get no questions, right? And it's almost the reverse. And also um, uh, building on that, after you talk about the startup, could you tell us about the, a little bit about the eligibility criteria and how you got it so pared down? So, um, so regarding the startup, and I will say that, um, again, Paul and his team have enrolled some of the first patients. Yes. And so um, I think we're going to 
Paul on Paul on a little talk, bit. We're going to we're going to talk with the sites that have enrolled some patients to start to look at how we might um, offer some kind of FAQ and mm -hmm. and um, understanding because clearly not having lab scans, mm -hmm. dedicated chemo for the standard of care does confuse people who are used to using a protocol as their full guideline. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we're guiding people through with questions right now, but I think we need to have some kind of um, something for the sites to help to start them up and understanding mm -hmm. um, what kind of standards of care are for doing scans, for doing labs every cycle and things like that for, for patients. And so I think that's something that we'll be working on mm -hmm. um, very shortly. And um, and then the eligibility back and forth um, a lot. So we still get a lot of questions about the eligibility because it's a very specific population of patients who have had immunotherapy and had some benefit on immunotherapy, and patients who have had chemotherapy and then and had had subsequent progression. And we decided to allow patients with um, now in this you know 2023 when we're giving perioperative therapy. We're allowing patients with neoadjuvant therapy, with adjuvant therapy, and that counts if they progress within that mm -hmm. 365 days, as we generally would consider for a patient that, with upfront therapy. And so we've considered that and add that, but it adds a level of complexity mm -hmm. in as, um, again, as our coordinators are going through their list, but they're very good at sending us, this is what they've received and are they eligible? But there, those are some, some issues still. Um, but outside of that, we still do sometimes get, where are the laughs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and how, how do I determine whether my patient has progressed or things like that? Because mm -hmm. we're not doing that. But when we, when we did the eligibility, it was difficult. It was lots of phone calls and discussions across all of the groups and all of the players involved saying, can we take this out? Can we take this out? You know, and, and we basically, we started with S1800A and we were able to take some of the things out, um, but even, you know, taking labs out, can we really do that? Mm -hmm. And so that, that is the question. Can we have a protocol and take those yes. labs out, let people treat a person that they would normally treat in practice? Yes. And, um, and it was a very difficult thing. At one point, we got a recommendation to take out performance status. Yeah. And that became a hard no for a lot of people. <laughs> um, to the point of the question that was asked earlier, right? The eligibility criteria, where do you kind of find that balance, right? right? And you're talking about, we, we, we did, we did have to have some guardrails up, right? One of them was around performance status, but others you know, treat them personally yeah. as they can. And we got rid of most eligibility criteria. And I, yeah. now I, I'm really, I look at eligibility as I'm helping people write protocols and I still can't take as many out as we did. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And so I think it's, it's interesting. So it sounds like on the study startup, where you're getting a lot of the questions is, where's my study calendar? Yeah. Right. Where, the what, detail, what the is detail the protocol study tell calendar. Us to do right. That. Right. Yeah. right. We're very conditioned. Right. So this and I don't know if Dan wants to speak to that as far as the community. Yeah. Yeah. And how is that? I think Dan, along those lines, I think what we want to hear is what do you think is um, that benefit actually that's adding to the community? Well, I think it's it's a very interesting point. We're opening up the study right now at my site, and we've been having more issues with opening cooperative group studies because of standard of care issues. Mm -hmm. And this study flew through mm -hmm. because they were like, oh, this is easy. I, right. We don't have to look for labs. We're not worried about mm -hmm. having to do um, scans X, Y, Z and figuring out who's going to end up paying for them. Yep. And so I think ultimately it is going to make things easier. Mm -hmm. and one of the things we talked about yesterday in the community engagement subcommittee is maybe making a best practice type thing where we say, okay, the study coordinator and the investigator probably needs to sit at the beginning and maybe write a little one pager and say, mm -hmm. hey, this is what we're going to actually treat with. This is how often we're going to do it. And this is when we're going to scan. So yeah. that way they've created their own, own yeah. you know, uh, study. Of that's a great, events. that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ping off that a little bit and, and go to uh, Dr. Allen, who's joining us virtually. And so when we, when you hear all of this, um, we would love to hear from friends about what you think are some of the key take takeaways from this. Uh, and also, how do we measure success? You know, a little bit building off of what Mary said, Dr. Redmond said, right? We're going to try it, right? We're going to pare this down, but how do we know what's our definition of success? Yeah, uh, 
Well, thanks for the opportunity to join you, uh, albeit remotely, but even remotely, I can hear you know, the excitement around this trial, which is, which is really, it's really terrific to see. And, you know, credit to this study team that has put in the work um, to move this forward with a variety of partnerships, you know, both in, in and out of government, um, across your network with other collaborators, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, with the companies and external organizations. I think it's a, a terrific opportunity. And hopefully that's what can be emphasized here, you know, as sites think about launching this. Um, you know, from a federal policy standpoint, we've seen recent initiatives that really have tried to lean in on many of the things that this trial can be a case study for, you know, things like simplifying trials, um, in, improving diversity and inclusion in trials, um, you know, so I think those are some of the things that, that should be kind of thought about measuring. And, mm -hmm. and even though Mary said the analysis of the study itself might be boring, there, there's probably some other metrics that will be pretty exciting here. And mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, all of you have shown that, that, you know, some of these successes can already be demonstrated, you know, things like a pared down consent form, or, um, you know, a rapid startup time, even despite this being a new model. Mm -hmm. But I really think, you know, it should be a Great. challenge that mm -hmm. as a community, if we're able to uh, you know, move forward and show that these types of trials can accrue faster, um, be more inclusive of more patients, be open at more sites, um, be of interest to a greater number of patients. I think this is a this is a terrific opportunity for a prototype of where this could be applied into the future. It's wonderful. Completely, completely, completely agree. And, and you know, I also want to bring in our, our partners here. And we have some big players here with us, uh, Dr. Malik. I wanted to ask from the NCI's perspective, S2302 Pragmatic Alone. I think it's safe to say this is uh, potentially a new paradigm, right, for oncology trials. We you know we do pragmatic, practical studies as a cooperative group as a whole. One of the differences here is this is a randomized phase three clinical trial. It's also a registration intent study. And I don't think, I don't want that to get lost on the audience. And so within that setting, we're doing, we're kind of piloting this in lung cancer, but we want to hear from the NCI in this setting. How do we move this across more malignancies, not just in thoracic malignancies, but what about other tumor types? What, what are our next steps? Um, so I just want to bring a couple of points. So first uh, point is that, you know, the pragmatica in this is the first exciting in oncology, but these kind of trials have been going on mm -hmm. since 60s or even earlier for earlier. patients with diabetes, older patients, um, you know, nephrology and all that. So, but this is the first one that is, we are doing in lung cancer, I mean, or oncology. I will say oncology. Um, second point is that not all the trials can be pragmatic. Mm -hmm. The reason that this became a pragmatic is because we had data, we mm -hmm. had the drugs that we knew what their toxicity was, mm -hmm. and we had data, as Mary said, that it, the toxicity was less. So with that, you know, but it's still exciting that mm -hmm. can we do uh, trials that have less barriers mm -hmm. and can it be, we do trials that we can do in community or, out, you know, like a real uh, patient trials. Um, so as you know, that NCI has been uh, a big, um, uh, has been giving a big push on each protocol to in, in broaden the eligibility criteria. Mm -hmm. So we cannot anymore have mm -hmm. uh, any trial that has a performance status of zero to one. Mm -hmm. We have to explain whenever we, uh, the protocol comes, we have to say why. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and the same way, if there is a, you know, renal function, liver mm -hmm. dysfunction, you will get, you're always getting notes. Why are you going to exclude them? HIV. So we're already trying to do that Perfect. broadening. Okay. Uh, but this is a new, and this is something that we are now all uh, trying to learn that can we do more trials like this? I think we can. Mm -hmm. And as right. you know, that there's an innovation unit that is being put by the um, NCI. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, of course, you know, it's still in the very infancy mm -hmm. um, at the moment. But we, you know, we have to learn, and that the the uh, the unit is to see if we can do similar trials in other diseases. Maybe one or two over a year until we figure out how to do these trials Perfect. right. Yeah, that's very exciting, and I think um, you know you can definitely share all this with the with our colleagues across the cooperative cooperative groups. And we also have uh, you know the FDA on the line, uh, Dr. Singh, and so we just heard 
the um, uh, NCI's thoughts on pragmatic trials as a whole. We also definitely want to hear your thoughts from the FDA on pragmatic trials. Um, yeah, thanks. And you know, I'm 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 also glad to join you from DC. Wish I was there with you. Um, hopefully, you see many of you at ASCO. You know, FDA actually um, uncharacteristically and probably probably will not do so in the future, but we actually played a really intricate role in mm -hmm. this in this particular trial. I mean, we were um, Rick Pastor, you know, my my boss. We we he he really pushed the idea of a pragmatic mm -hmm. trial. Um, certainly, he's been you know around uh, for several years, so saw those mega trials in cardiology. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the connection mm -hmm. with. Our current commissioner, Dr. Califf, who is a huge, who is a cardiologist and a huge proponent of pragmatic trials. So um, we, there was definitely a sense of um, perceived risk or maybe real risk uh, with paring down the protocol. We got a lot of pushback mm -hmm. um, from the investigators from SWOG and mm -hmm. you know just saying, are you and, and really from industry. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> with the very streamlined approach. And I think that it really required us to say uh, that this was in fact appropriate and okay in this scenario and we were encouraging it. Um, I think that there, we, as Jeff mentioned, you know, Congress has asked FDA to be more flexible, creative, thoughtful about where we get data from. And a lot of people immediately think about real world data or this external controls, but that's not mm -hmm. actually, it's actually can be quite problematic. And the beauty mm -hmm. of this pragmatic trial is that it is prospective and randomized. So it is innovative. It is gathering new data. It is, you know, streamlining clinical trials. It's decentralizing. It's doing many, many things that we're being asked to do and that are appropriate. Um, it's bringing OS back to the forefront, like in this trial, as you know, the most meaningful, very meaningful endpoint. And yeah. I believe, and I'm sorry to say this, but I believe that we may be seeing a slight slowdown in the pace of drug innovation in the pipeline, or perhaps a little bit of a stopgap where the next new big thing may be still at the bottom of a test tube somewhere or just mm. entering into clinic. <laughs> and I believe that we should use this time to take the drugs, take stock of the drugs and the therapies that we have and do thoughtful, pragmatic trials um, to answer actual more scientific questions about sequencing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about you know the what therapies are available to us and what the best is first second and so forth mm -hmm. um that's what i believe we should be working with industry and you know cooperative groups to do um i do want to see more pragmatic trials in mm -hmm. other spaces but i think mm -hmm. lung has some space for perioperative work roy mm -hmm. talked about it when he presented mm -hmm. it in data, and I saw your beautiful interview in the ASCO post. That is what mm -hmm. I am pushing for. That is mm -hmm. what I believe should follow uh, this Great. trial. But when you get out of this lung room and go talk to your colleagues in other disease areas, other therapeutic areas, you should take this enthusiasm and you know get their juices flowing so that they can propose some pragmatic trials. Mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I think uh, you know referencing. Um, uh, Roy's plenary discussion at AACR, and he talked about the Aegean, he was discussing for the Aegean study. And um, as you heard from Dr. Mack, we're gonna be moving forward, we hope, with some early stage lung cancer um, trials. This I think is really where we need to go. And you know, I just wanna ask Roy to kind of give his thoughts on the wave of the future. And then Dr. Singh, I'm coming right back to you with another question. Well, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, it's just so wonderful to see this have come to fruition. And, you know, Harpreet says it right. You know, when we, you know, this has been a public-private partnership from the very beginning. And I think it's important to remember that this trial came out of LungMap, which was a partnership between two companies, Merck and Lilly, working together. David Gadera, that was not easy. Uh, Karen Kelly, others that, you know, mm -hmm. Karen Redcamp, we made it happen. 
And then um, when that was positive and we presented at ASCO, um, with a lot of help from friends, seeing Jeff Allen there and Alan Siegel having friends as a partner, we approached the, uh, the FDA for a breakthrough designation, which, by the way, the trial got. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and then the next step was get two companies to do a, a trial to get this drug approved. That would be a $40, $50 million trial, over 1,000 patients, a lot of data. And you know, it might have happened, but it might not have. But then you know, this whole idea of the pragmatic trial was, was broached. And as Harpreet said, you know, by the FDA and you know, with help from the NCI and, and friends, and we talked about it. And um, I, was, I, was, I had a difficult task to bring the teams together and get everyone to hear about it and, and, and agree. And I still remember that first call. And um, you know, they said, you don't have to do this. And Merck said, what? Are you? And they brought in their regulatory people. No, you can't leave that out of the trial if you want to do regulatory approval. Yeah. Lily said the same. Even Karen here, we, she, the first LOI she put in, Rick Pazner was ready to pull out his hair because he said, I told you not to do it. Yeah. Because yeah. really all we need from this trial is survival yeah. because we already know these drugs are approved and we want to get it done quickly and do a survival endpoint. And the fact that it's going and it's ongoing and it's getting to access to diverse populations and it's open at all these sites, it's even almost open at our site, right? Uh, gang, you know, and uh, yeah. that almost never happens so early. So you know, <laughs> this is really good, but it's, it, I just, I just want to say we do need more of these public-private partnerships and getting to the question you actually asked me, mm -hmm. we have to all work together. Yes. There's got to be pre-competitive uh, cooperation. We're about to talk about, you know, the perioperative space. So I've done a lot of research on this because I presented at AACR. There are four or five trials with drugs that have all looked at this against the control that's not even the control that we use today, yeah. which is Checkmate 816. Yeah. And then the question is going to be, where do we go? So I, I did pre present at AACR uh, the idea of a pragmatic trial. I actually had Olympic rings and said all the drugs could work together. And I made the, I made the point, the drugs are really not that much different, which actually I think is probably true. There are subtle differences perhaps in half-life and pharmacology and you know, anti-drug antibodies. But for the most part, the same. I must tell you, every company has emailed me, are you sure, Roy? Do you really mean that? Our drug is better than yours. <laughs> but, but we have to answer fundamental questions. Yeah. Do you need adjuvant therapy if you've given neoadjuvant, if you've had a past year? How much? So I think a pragmatic design would work, but it really would mean changing not only what we've talked about here, more simple designs, but working together and pre-competitive co collaboration and everyone moving forward. And that's going to require some governmental you know, uh, uh, insights as well. But I actually think that the perioperative approach is going to need this. And then Harpreet's exactly right. You know, Jeff Allen, we need to then get the tissue. We can still get tissue. Just because it's pragmatic doesn't mean you haven't put the patient on the trial and then you can go back and get their tissue. tissue. And let's keep the science in our trials. The one thing I would urge, you know, and, you know, doing this for so long, as many of you have, we have to learn from each trial. But it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be part of this team. And hopefully LungMath will produce a few more of these, right? All right. Sounds perfect to me. And, I, and you know, something you said um, uh, s s resonates, I will say, just being, you know, obviously being very involved in this as well. And that and I want to hear from Dr. Singh um, about this is that we, we've partnered together, right? We've partnered across SWAG, we've partnered across the NCI, we've partnered with the FDA. We've also partnered with pharmaceutical companies. And, um, you know, and this is a registration intent study. At the end of the day, the individuals that are going to be submitting the documents to the FDA are actually the pharmaceutical companies. And so I wanted to, in that setting, ask Dr. Singh, what's been that experience? What's your vision and what's your vision for the future of working with pharmaceutical companies? Um, some, are which, some of which are in this room now, um, uh -huh. about future studies. Um, well, look, you know, I have been working side by side with companies ever since I joined the FDA. I, I think that they have a role to play. Uh, we all have our roles to play in drug development, and they have a role to play in driving and continuing innovation. I do think that they do need to and always will consider their business interests. That is just factual. Um, and so depending on the novelty of their asset, you know, you may not see the same level of enthusiasm to promote a pragmatic or streamlined trial. And that may actually make sense, you know, as tracking with the science. Um, maybe you do need a lot more data. But but I think that um, there is enthusiasm from pharma uh, for these types of trials um, in select circumstances. And I think that once this 
perceived or real regulatory risk. I think it is perceived, but we will see, you know, what, what actual, you know, how the data looks when it comes. Hopefully it is very straightforward and easy, and I think it will be. Um, hopefully more companies will be more enthusiastic, more willing, and that will track with CROs. I think that's One great. thing that wasn't mentioned was CROs. Um, they they don't necessarily benefit from this type of um, trial design, and I have heard that feedback. Um, that's okay, you know. Again, yeah. there's room for everybody, yeah. and um, so yeah. I mean, pharma. I, that was your question. I, yeah. I think we work well together. We all play well in the sandbox. Um, but of course, they're going to, you know, I think the novelty of the asset probably is one of the biggest factors. Yeah, very, very, very true. And I think it's what you're saying that there's there's enough space for everybody it goes back to what uh, Dr. Lara had said to, earlier about making sure that our portfolios are balanced, right? Having those pragmatic trials, having those ones that take a deeper dive into the, the, science, the science, so to speak. Um, and so Dan, um, Dr. Carazosa has really served as our community outreach um, and has worked very well with Frank DeSanto in the back there, as well as um, uh, Dr. Heskes. And so Dr. Heskes has spent, ha, was the first site to open Pragmatica. And so I wanted to ask him to, to share some thoughts. Uh, what are his experiences? And then we'll uh, open up. So please come to the mic um, uh, with any other questions. And any questions, you can just type them in the chat, and Roy's in charge of the chat. Yeah, we have nothing online as of now. Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Heskes? So I think that, first of all, there was uh, there was a number of factors. There clearly was a, a buzz about this study because there had been a lot of sort of discussion about this. And, and so I think there was a lot of um, sort of uh, excitement that it already was building. Um, I think, secondly, I think the study team uh, was successful in sort of getting a lot of information out there prior mm -hmm. to the actual activation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we we literally were literally ready to go <laughs> as soon as we heard that the uh, study had been approved. And and I think that um, you know for for many sites, I mean, we we have less bureaucracy at our site, and so obviously having you know the central IRB is incredibly helpful because. The you know they have obviously a very facile process for the local IRB to sort of seed responsibility. We don't have multiple layers of review. We don't have scientific review you know prior to having to get you know approval. Mm -hmm. So it's really and I, I suspect a lot of community sites would have the ability to sort of activate in a very very uh, easy way in a very quick way, and and we're happy to if at some point. Um, Karen, you want to have a forum. I mean, our mm -hmm. our lead um, uh, study um, officer uh, basically is is very very good at this, and probably would be a very useful resource to try to educate. This isn't going to apply to every site because, as Roy said, there are sites that you just have to have you know bureaucracy, and you go through multiple layers, no matter how simple the study. Mm -hmm. But you know, if this truly is a pragmatic study that is you know having appeal to community sites. There are many sites I think that are going to have a much smaller bureaucracy where you can actually do this in a facile way. Mm -hmm. So that really helped in terms of we were prepared, we were ready, and as soon as the site was approved, we moved ahead. And we even had in patients that identified ahead of time because, <laughs> because we had a sort of a sense of when the study was going to active. Now, if it didn't activate, we would have lost those patients because obviously you can't wait mm -hmm. in a definite period of time. But there was a pretty good coordination of when we thought the study was going to act, and so we could actually identify patients. The patients were very interested as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, clearly this resonated with them, um, and I think the the concept, you know, was was something that they could understand, and it seemed very simple. Mm -hmm. I think once it was active, um, we've cited some of the issues, and clearly one of the biggest challenges that we found was with our CRAs and our study nurses because. They, they just were very uncomfortable initially um, mm -hmm. because, you know, where, you mm -hmm. know, where is the uh, the list of things that I need to do? <laughs> yes. And yes. and it was very, very, you know, it may sound uh, easy to do something simpler. In many cases, it's actually more difficult and more complicated to do something simpler, especially if you're reversing what you've done for years. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that, again, 
Another thing would really be that would be helpful would be some type of explanation to sites and their CRAs and their study nurses mm -hmm. as to you know what the expectations are here. And I think one of the other things that, as as Dan said, that came out of our meeting is just basically for each you know physician to sort of work out you know with each patient sort of what the expectations are in terms of yes we're still going to do CAT scans yes we're still going to mm -hmm. do our our assessments et cetera. And, and this is kind of a, a list and it's going to be different for each site in terms of how they do that, but that's fine. It's real world, but probably just putting that expectation down there will make the study staff more comfortable that we're still going to collect the information that's essential to manage this patient, but it isn't something we're going to have to submit, you know, to you guys. So I think those were all things. And so, so I think I'm very enthusiastic about this study. I mean, clearly we don't know if it's going to reach the end point, but but clearly the study can still be a success if it's able to be carried mm -hmm. out, you know, in the way that we intended it to be, because then it can really be a uh, a way to sort of show us how we should move ahead in the future. Well, I think that's, that's outstanding. And I think, thank you very much for sharing all of those insights, the lessons learned that we can all then take back to our, our sites as well. And we'll definitely take that feedback back into account up here on the panel. Roy? No, I, I just want to say, Paul, I, I agree, actually. My, I've been getting texts from my team here where we're open at Yale. So, but <laughs> 28 days because again, it's it's simple. But you know, one of the reasons that Pragmatic works well, I think, in oncology is oncologists because we've had so many new drugs in the last every year. We have so many new drugs where we're we're used to you know you know dealing with you know you know a little bit more complexity and and so I think that the fact that someone can just pick what the standard of care is and and it is is great. The fact that you know people can decide how much scans they want to do or or what what has to be done, but it doesn't have to be part of a document where you're getting dinged for it. And uh, so I, I I think I agree with you completely. This just has to go quickly. It's important for all of us to educate. I see Frank DeSanto back there with the communications. And, you know, so so much that's gone out from Swag and, and and Will, but it's it's not just Swag. It's the whole intergroup. This was this I was at ECOG last week. Uh, giving a presentation and this was discussed at that uh, committee and hopefully at the Alliance. And we really, uh, let's get this trial done so the next pragmatic trial can be behind it. I agree, I agree. All right, I think um, we're just gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Allen to uh, and Dr. Singh and Dr. Malik to give us some final words. I think most of you guys have access to the rest of us um, and then we'll go on with our presentation. So we'll start with Dr. Allen, any final words when we close out our panel? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, I really think this did start. Um, I think it got off on the right step um, because of the creativity that Harpreet and her colleagues really showed. Um, because I don't, I don't think without that signal from FDA that this mm -hmm. was a pathway forward, that there would have been mm -hmm. the momentum to bring all of the other parties together um, to be able to work through some of the challenges. Um, but I think showing <laughs> that this is a viable future direction for this and other scenarios um, really kicked this off on the uh, on the right foot. Um, you know, Roy, I know you leveraged um, the charge that, uh, that that FDA posed forward and and some of the uh, various discussions to try and you know bring the companies on board and recognize the importance to this and you know the the expertise between you know Janelle, Karen, Mary, Shakun, the leadership at NCI, you know, to move this forward as rapidly as it was, I think, um, you know, like Dan said, even if this isn't successful, we have a template here that I think um, when criteria are met that are similar to this, hopefully this will be not a one-off experience, but something that can be very informative into the future. Well, thank you very much. I think that means a lot, uh, especially coming from friends. And thank you for your partnership. Dr. Singh? I don't have much to add. I think everything's been said. Um, I'm just so, you know, thrilled to be even part of this, like, victory lap. I feel like we're on for mm -hmm. Pragmatica. And just the thoracic oncology community is just super strong. Um, and the fact that they've been able to just really accomplish, I mean, so many amazing things, starting with, not starting with LungMAC, but I mean, uh, I mean, as LungMAC being the kind of initiator now yeah. for this really innovative trial, um, it would break my heart, you know, to see this be the only pragmatic trial. That is really my goal um, to, you know, learn, take every lesson from this, continue to sing its praises, 
at the highest levels, including, I, I think it should be included as cancer as part of moonshot. I mean, I really do. Um, and, and that's my ask actually. And, um, and my ask is that we, we really just continue the momentum. To, we talked about measures of success that, that that's my personal, I think it should be all of our uh, goals to, to see, to bring more of this into, into our landscape. Thanks for having me. All right, great. Thank, great to have you here. And Dr. Malik? Uh, um, no, I don't think I, uh, I think everything has been said, mm -hmm. but uh, we're all excited as you know about this trial. But I think I will uh, request every one of us to think what, what can be the next pragmatic next. trial, okay. because we shouldn't stop with one. Um, there are so many drugs that have been approved. I think the edge one, near edge one, um, approved therapies, those mm -hmm. I would think will be the, mm -hmm. should be the next. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you, all of you, for um, joining us today in uh, person as well as uh, virtually. And we really do appreciate, again, the partnership of friends, a partnership of the FDA, partnership of the NCI and the pharmaceutical companies. Um, we really could not have, have done this together unless the entire group got together collectively, um, went completely out of our comfort zone. So Paul, to your point, we understand how the coordinators feel because we have felt like that for the last nine months um, and uh, you know, look forward to working with the group to develop a more pragmatic study. So thank you very much and kudos to our panel. <laughs> all right Karen don't go too far all right so uh speaking of uh, pragmatic and how it started we're going to ask Dr. Reckham to just give us uh, some high level updates on all the excitement ongoing in lung map thank you so we had some earlier lung map meetings where we went uh, through some of the specifics so I'm just going to go through where we're at right now with lung map and um and again this is the objective is to test the patient specimens to determine eligibility for participation in biomarker driven and non match sub studies included within the lung map umbrella protocol. And um, I think I'm just gonna. So, this is patients are um, right now, they are identified for the most part through um, foundation CDX testing. And um, and they have to most of the most of the sub studies require, or at least in the past, required anti PD one and platinum based therapy. And uh, we'll talk about how that's somewhat changing. Um, the non match sub study assignments are for those who are not eligible for any biomarker driven sub study. Here's our current schema. Um, so here we have uh, the targeted therapy naive um, sub studies, and uh, that includes 1900 E which is for sotorasib, um, 1900I, which uh, will be for exon 20 insertions, um, MET amplification, uh, 1900J, which is, uh, again, MET amplification with bispecific antibody, and 1900K for MET exon 14 skipping. So looking, moving this forward to more um, targeted therapies and naive populations, which is um, not where we've done a lot of st studies in the past. And then another area where we've not done a lot of uh, treatment is in the TKI treated resistant area. And so um, Dr. Gray's uh, study with sulfurcatinib with chemotherapy for patients who have progressed on prior RET inhibitor. And then um, uh, 1900G, which just opened, which we'll hear a little bit more about for EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer with acquired MET amplification um, resistance. And they get EGFR, MET, and uh, anti-VEGF2 uh, therapy versus standard of care. And uh, so these are kind of new areas in looking at specific resistance. I will say that I never tested my EGFR patients for lung map because there wasn't anything for them. So this is a new paradigm. And um, so even our EGFR patients potentially could be eligible for an arm here. Um, and at this moment, um, we don't have any open studies for non-match, uh, which uh, we are working hard to move along and uh, hope that we will get uh, S1800E um, as a anti-PD-1, VEGF2, and docetaxel combination and uh, con continuing to work on that. Um, here's where we are now. Um, screening registrations, over 3,000. Um, Substudy assignments, um, 1651. And uh, substudy registrations um, for the new lung map is uh, 445. 
um, our collaborators all here. We um, are always looking for novel therapies, novel combinations, and new partners to work with. One of the big uh, movements forward is that we are working to expand our NGS platform um, to allow for additional uh, uh additional for additional uh, NGS platforms in order to enter into um, both the unmatched and the match sub studies and we're working actively on that as uh, probably one of the next amendments and then the potential to utilize CTDNA. Um, the impact is here, which I think you've heard a lot about uh, over the past uh, year, that um, we are impacting patients. And, uh, and again, the Pragmatica study is a big example of how we are impacting patients. So I'll move on to S1900E, and this is our phase two study of sotorasib in patients with previously treated um, non-small cell lung cancer um, with KRAS G12C mutation, um, but not for patients who have previously received prior um, a KRAS G12C therapy. So the chair is Dr. Pata, who recently moved to Fox Chase and is not here today, and the co-chair, Dr. Gerber at UT Southwestern, who is also not here today. Um, and again, these patients have recurrent or metastatic KRAS G12C, but they're not uh, pri previously treated with a G12C inhibitor. And this is really to look at the subsets of um, KRAS. And so in still incredibly important, even though sotorasib is available um, off, uh, off study, um, looking at uh, the TP53 mutant, the STK11 mutant, and other co-mutations. Um, this is, um, I believe, like 85% enrolled at this point in time. And um, oh, I think it's on the next slide. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yeah. So we are 77% enrolled, but um, so we're nearly a complete enrollment for the TP53, um, about half for the SDK11 and moving along for the others. Um, it was first activated about two years ago. And, uh, and we're, uh, again, we have uh, the race and ethnicity you see here, um, about 10% uh, Black and 1% Asian, um, and most patient, the 87% uh, white patients. Um, there's been a lot of um, increasing awareness. There's been directed communication from the chair to investigators where patients have been assigned and registered. There's going to be a ASCO uh, trials in progress poster, and uh, they're finalizing statistics to analyze the CTDNA for these patients. And again, to understand these commutations and how they interact and how the responses look in these patients. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reichamp. So I, I don't believe that uh, Dr. Alamine is able is able to join us uh, online. Just very quickly as a reminder, um, the study has been all open. I think, uh, Karen, you had mentioned um, almost over, almost a year now, I think. Um, and we have patients in pre-screening for this study. Uh, and I think it also just speaks to where we are with RET TKIs. They have not progressed yet. Um, but just to keep this study in mind, we're working very closely with the advocacy uh, organizations, including the Happy Lung Project, as well as the RET Renegades, and appreciate um, uh, Judy's help with connecting us with those, with those teams, as well as FNIH. And just to remind people, this is for patients with RET, uh, Harbor RET, RET fusion, and they'll be randomized to chemotherapy plus or minus continuation of a RET inhibitor. We are working uh, on an amendment. One of the things that we heard is that those patients who are maybe on a RET TKI as a single agent have had to have some dose reductions. And so perhaps that's uh, causing some issues with eligibility there. So we're working through that. Uh, but just please do keep this study in mind. All right, and with that, we'll go to Dr. Goldberg her newly opened study. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we heard a really nice introduction to the shift a little bit in thinking about lung map um, from Karen in both the RET trial and now this trial, not just for uh, targeted therapy naive patients anymore. So, um, so this is a trial. I'll just get right to the schema here for sake of time. This is a trial for patients with EGFR mutant uh, lung cancer who are progressing. So they must have received osimertinib in their most recent line of treatment. Besides that, the eligibility regarding prior lines of therapy is pretty broad. So you can have chemotherapy, you can have immune therapy, they're not required. You can have had osimertinib and other TKIs, but just OC has to be in the most recent prior line of therapy. 
Um, we do allow untreated and asymptomatic brain metastases. And then patients are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive, I'm sorry, I forgot like the main part of the study, which is med amplification. So the idea here is that patients who have, are treated with osimertinib, there's a, a, a pretty high incidence of med amplification. And some studies, as high as 20% of patients will develop med amplification at resistance. And so the, the, this study is looking at uh, combining um, uh, um, uh, EGFR inhibitor, osimertinib, with capmatinib, and that's in both arms. So all the patients will get EGFR plus met, uh, inhibition, and then the patients are randomized to also receive ramiseramab or not, um, with the primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So again, we'll know all these patients at baseline will have EGFR mutations. That's not what we're looking for on lung map. What we're really looking for is met amplification. And so it's a, a bit... Tricky because it's different than what we're used to seeing in lung map. There's a lot of ways to detect met amplification that are allowed on this study. So we tried to be really broad so it's easy to find these patients. If you have a patient progressing on, on osimertinib and you haven't tested them yet for mechanisms of resistance, you can submit material, you can su submit biopsy material, and we'll test it um, using kind of the standard lung map procedure. That's possibility one. Possibility two is... Uh, if you have uh, foundation one testing already and it shows met amplification, you could submit that result and they can go on. And then the last is if you've tested them locally, either with blood or tumor tissue, and it shows met amplification, um, that assay can be used. And we're, we were pretty generous with the assays that you can use there. Um, so really, we, we try to be uh, um, uh, try to keep this broad so that you can, when you find met amplification, you could put these patients on. So we're really excited about this study. It just opened within the last few weeks. We already have some activity and I uh, really appreciate your support of it. Thank you. Sarah, can I ask you, what, yeah. uh, can I ask you a question? Um, do you, what if you get the report and you have the met inflammation, but they lose the EGFR? Um, yeah, so, so that doesn't typically happen um, at the tumor level. So the biopsy level, that is I think it would be pretty unusual to lose it, but you can sometimes not see it in blood. blood right? So that's fine. If there's EGFR at baseline and it's a blood assay and you just see met, it should be fine. The other thing that I think came up the other day in, in a meeting was um, what level of met amplification. It's really whatever the assay you're using, if they're calling it met amplified, it's amplified for, for the purposes of this trial. <laughs> we had a lot of discussion on that, but that's that's the reason. Hey, pragmatic. Exactly. Pragmatic, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, if, if you I need to repeat the question. Can this or something? Yeah. Does that count to number three? As yes. Three? So, so we, I didn't go into the details. So I was trying to rush, but I'll just mention because this is, a, it's a good question. Yeah. So for tissue-based assays, any is fine as long as it's in a CLIA lab. So yes, anything, any commercial assay, even in-house assays that are CLIA if you're using it for patients, any tissue base. We are a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more narrow with blood-based assays, just because there's so many out there that haven't been validated as well. So we only are allowing Foundation and Garden 360 for blood-based assays as of now. But I think that's what most people are using. Same, but right. happy to hear feedback and they about have to that. Upload the reports of, yeah. the, of the test results. Yes. Um, we'll have a panel that looks at this and just validates everything. So. But. And then for for people who submit blood results or even tissue results, we're asking for tissue for correlatives, but it's not required. So like if you just do a blood test, you get met amplification, they can go on without having to submit to having to do a biopsy. Good, thank you so much. Just remind people of. Oh, yeah. how convenient. This is not a lung map study, but I'm already up here. So this works out. Um, so, so right. So I'm the study champion for this, um, this study, which is EA 5182. It's a phase three trial also for EGFR patients. This is a first line trial though. It's a, um, a trial of osimertinib plus or minus bevacizumab for the treatment of EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer patients who are treatment naive. Um, I just wanted to remind you about this. I, it's going fairly slowly in accrual. I'll show you updates on the next slide, um, but highlighted in yellow here are kind of some unique and, and maybe enticing features of this trial if you're thinking about opening it or thinking about putting patients on it. Um, there's really a big focus on, on brain metastases here. So many of our patients with EGFR lung cancer have brain met, so there's a big focus on that in, in the eligibility that patients are allowed and then looking at those afterwards. Um, atypical EGFR mutations are allowed, so not just the common ones, um, and then ECOG zero to two. 
And then the, the drugs are provided by the sponsor, which is sometimes enticing for people as well. So we are about getting to be about a third. This is a little old, so about a third of the way there. But a lot of sites have this open. So please keep it in mind. It's a pretty easy trial to enroll patients. Actually, Dr. Herbst just uh, identified a patient and was able to, to, to um, uh, use his uh, blood um, uh, CT DNA results to uh, uh, prove that the patient had an EGFR mutation could go on. Um, and so we're getting there. It's slow but steady accrual and uh, and really, again, appreciate your help with this study as well. It's an important combination that it's an unanswered question and uh, really want to get this trial accrued. So again, email me or call me with any questions or feedback. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we'll go to Dr. Rustavan's study. I think you're on, he's on joining us virtually. Yeah, thank you. Right, perfect. So this is the uh, Maverick SWOG S1827 study, and it's a randomized trial of brain MRI surveillance plus or minus PCI for patients with small cell lung cancer. Next slide. Sorry. Come on, Peter. There you go. Thank you. So here's the schema. So it's a one-to-one a -one randomization uh, to brain MRI surveillance plus or minus PCI, and it includes both limited and extensive stage small cell lung cancer. The primary endpoint is overall survival as a non-inferiority endpoint, and a key ongoing secondary endpoint is cognitive failure-free survival. Next slide. In terms of importance, Maverick is the first ever randomized trial of brain MRI surveillance plus or minus PCI in patients with limited stage disease. And it's also critical to resolving the conflicting uh, randomized data on PCI in extensive stage disease. And so overall, the trial has the potential to make brain MRI surveillance the standard of care for all small cell lung cancer patients, which would be an important advancement. Um, in terms of updates, the trial has now accrued, as of today, 144 patients, and it's averaging about five patients per month. And this is a substantial number of patients for a modern PCI trial, but it is also below our accrual goal rate. And uh, we recently, this week, submitted uh, an amendment to the NCI, which is now under review, uh, which proposes a change in the primary endpoint to our ongoing secondary endpoint of cognitive failure-free survival. And the hypothesis there is that MRI surveillance alone would result in improved cognitive failure-free survival. And if that's approved, this would um, reduce the accrual goal um, as we've proposed to a range of around 250 patients, which would be on par with the landmark PCI trials in this space, including the, the trials from the Japanese and EORTC groups. 